This program features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. This program features live coverage of an African safari. The boys and girls of Sutherland Elementary School, Captain School Elementary School and RC Logan School, a very big welcome. And what you see there is a house or a home or small insects that we call termites. We're very happy to have you on board. And my name is David. And with me today on camera is Senzo. We're very happy to have you joining us today for two of the schools that you've been with us before. Good to have you back for the new school, Logan, that you're joining us for the first time. Make sure you keep joining us every other time and we'll give you a chance to tell you about all the wilderness we have here. We are in South of you to ask you a few questions through your teachers, give us some comments and some thoughts, and we'll be happy to let you know what's happening here. It's a great day. We've got temperatures of about 73 degrees Fahrenheit and about 23 degrees Celsius. All right, we are going to move now, and what we just showed you a few minutes ago was a house or a home of some small insects called termites. We shall be showing you small things and also big things. With me today, there's another girl by the name of Taylor, She'll be out driving like me, and we got another boy by the name of Steve Ovo or Steve, who will be making trucks and walking around. Well, out here in the bush, boys and girls, anything could happen. We could do one corner like this, and we see some interesting animals. We drive sometimes for a whole five minutes, we see nothing. And the times you drive, every one minute, a giraffe, a leopard, or maybe a lion, or maybe an elephant, it could be anything. So keep your eyes open, and don't forget, to ask us questions through your teachers. All right, Senzo ready? Okay, it's me and Senzo out hunting to get you as most animals as possible. Okay, very good. Very good, a bit cloudy today, but uh, we are not worried. We shall also be looking at some birds. Let's see if those birds gonna stop there. And on top of there, we got some birds there. Sorry, you might be seeing a bit of pole as the camera was moving. It's because we are not very sure of the weather. We got a feeling it might rain. We had some clouds earlier, but because we don't want to get any chances, we got the roof on and that bird there is called a starling. We got so many species of birds in Africa and we'll be giving you their names as we see them. This particular one here is called the Bachelors Starling, but for now, just keep the name Starling. It's either calling its mate and birds will always make some calls to communicate. I do not know whether you have Starlings where you come from. So that's how they communicate. Either it could be calling another one. So I'll also want you, if we hear the ones that will be making very loud calls, we'll request you to imitate and see how good you are or whether you can be better than these birds in Africa. All right, now i just shown you a starling. Let's find out what other bird Taylor will show you. I think it's going to be a very, very good day for some birds. This one is called a Koki Franklin, but it's playing hide and seek with us now. That's so cool. We'll see if we can get another view of it. My name is Taylor, and on camera with me today is David, and we're very excited to have you all on safari with us. So remember to ask us lots and lots of questions. And hopefully we're going to find you some other things other than just birds. But in South Africa, we're really lucky. We've got some of the prettiest builds, builds, birds in the world is what I was trying to say. Where did you go? They're so camouflaged too. So that means, because it's quite a big word, camouflage, means that it's feathers, the way that they are colored, helps them blend into the vegetation. Disappeared behind, can you see it? Look at that. Look how camouflaged it is. It looks exactly like the leaves. It's just running away. Oh, no, it's pecking. It's like a chicken. Maybe it's seen some insects or something under there, under the tr underneath all those shrubs. And it's a very windy day, so I think that that's a good place to hide away. Here it goes. That's amazing. I bet if I didn't tell you that we were looking at an animal, some of you wouldn't even know that there was actually a bird there. Now, there's a male and a female Koki Franklin, so a boy and a girl. And that one that we were looking at now, that was the girl. 
Where did the boy go? He's got the very, very orange head. He's somewhere in there too. But like I said, they're really good at playing hide and seek. And sometimes you can't even find them again. No? Where we are going, no, I'm... Wendy's not working very well. So we're going to be going towards Chitwa, which is another game reserve, and they've got a really big dam there, which is very exciting. Um, sorry, Luke, can you please say that again? The wind is so loud today that I can barely hear anything. Ah, there we go. Edison, now you've asked me how many safaris I've been on. Oh my goodness, I've been on so many safaris. Edison, do you know that I've been going on, on safari since I was a little girl, since I was even younger than all of you that are watching today. I would go into the Kruger National Park. So that's a big uh, game reserve, like, like almost like Yellowstone Park or, or um, Yosemite National Park, all those different places. We have them here, but of course we don't have bears and bison and things like that. We've got lions and leopards and all those really cool animals, which hopefully we'll see. So that's where I uh, used to go on safari. Now I don't work too far away. The Kruger National Park is just over there. In, in fact, so I couldn't even tell you how long I've been going on safaris. Well, I've been going on safaris almost every single day, though, for the last... Wow, almost seven years now. So it's been a long time. It's been a very, very long time. Now, Kaylin, you've asked what is the most common thing, what common animal? <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> sneezes. All the sneezes today. Sorry, Kaylin. So you've asked what is the most common animal that we see on safari? I'm going to have to go with all the different types of birds. We often, oh, we always see birds. And then also uh, an animal called an impala. And I'm pretty sure we're gonna be able to find you an impala today. So I'm gonna keep looking for one like this. So they're very cool. They're a type of an antelope. So they're not a deer like what you get. And they're really pretty. But I think today, I don't think they're gonna have very pretty shiny coats. That's one thing that they're known for, is they've got the most beautiful hair on their bodies. But because it's a little bit cold, you can see I've got my scarf on, I've got my jersey on. I think that they're gonna be all fluffy trying to stay warm. Right, but we're gonna go find you some animals now. And I think that Steve is doing exactly the same thing on Bushwalk. Good afternoon, good afternoon, boys and girls. How are we all doing? Probably the morning for you. It's afternoon for us. My name is Steve Falkenridge. I'm joined on camera by Fergus, and we are indeed on foot in the African bush. And the reason why we're here, what we're doing, is we heard birds going absolutely crazy. And out here, what we call, that is an alarm call. And quite often you can find little things like small owls or even a snake and the birds were going absolutely ballistic behind us. I'm going to show you where they were looking. And so we try to stick our nose in there. This bush that's been pushed over, this bush was pushed over. You can see that the grass is very, very long. It's quite a thorny tree, so very difficult to get inside there. The perfect habitat for a snake to be in. And we've been sticking our nose in there and seeing if we can find it. And you might think we're a little bit crazy to be doing that, but you can do it if you're very careful and very slow in your movements. And I've got a nice big stick here, so I can sort of poke around with the stick. But we weren't able to find anything. I mean, a lot of these snakes are extremely camouflaged. Do you know what the word camouflaged means? Completely blend into the background, so they disappear. So we can't really see them unless they move. And that's why actually it's very important to listen to the birds. Like Taylor had that Franklin. We listen to them and they help us find lions and leopards. Collins, I would love to show you some lions. There were some lions yesterday in the area, but they've kind of moved a little bit further west. But what we're doing is this morning there was tracks of a female leopard and her little cub. And they moved in this direction. And tracks is what we're looking for. Tracks is what the marks they leave in the sand. Um, just like that with my shoe. Not very clear right now, but we do have an expert with us. He's just over there, over there, his name is Herbie, and we're going to be walking in that direction and seeing if we can find a leopard with her cub. Wouldn't that be marvelous? Let's go, Fergus. So we're going to keep going on in this direction, and hopefully we find some tracks of the leopard and her cub.
very good. Steve is very good when he walks because he sees some wonderful things. But because we are driving, we have come and we have seen a different type of a big antelope here. Two, two of them, in fact, you see one passing behind it. And the one laying down there is called a wild beast. And you kids, you are very lucky. If you look behind it, there's another one, brown, that's called an impala. So in one frame, you're seeing two species of different antelopes. You can notice carefully, this impala here got horns because it's a male. The one you're seeing, the big one there, that's called a wildebeest, you'll get both males and females having horns. You might have heard of migration of the wildebeest in Africa. These are the animals that do all the migration. The ones you're seeing on your frame now that are called the impalas do not do the migration. And if you look carefully, the sizes of their horns are different because of age. So the bigger the horns, in general, it means the antelope is older or it's bigger. So those two could be of the same age and you notice their horns are very big. Remember as I said, they are called impalas. And these are males, if you see the females, they will not have the horns. Rebecca, how are you? And that's a very interesting question. What is my most interesting animal I've ever seen on safari, Rebecca? Rebecca will tell you, every day I see an elephant, it's a new day and I get excited, like it's my first elephant. Like I've never seen another elephant, Rebecca, before. So hopefully today, Rebecca, and the other boys and the other girls will be able to show you some elephants. And you're going to see how my face is going to glow with happiness and joy. If we see the elephants, so if we see the elephant, it's exciting. We want to show you the same antelopes we just showed you, shown you a few minutes ago. The antelope that I told you is called the wildebeest at a different time. And they're not very far from where we are. So, so let me know where to stop. Danan, you're asking me what's the weirdest animal I have ever seen on safari. It is a very small, funny-looking animal that's called a pangolin. And a pangolin is like a rodent, and it got scales on the body. And when it gets scared, it rolls on the ground, and it looks like a ball. So that's the most weirdest animal I've ever seen on a safari. And it's called a pangolin and very hard to see them because they only come out at night. You rarely see them during the day. And if you look carefully there, Steve, yeah, Senzo have spotted something else. There's a pig for you. You see that one moving there? You kids are the luckiest kids in the world. You see there's a lot of movement of the branches of the trees there because today since this morning, it has been very windy. And when it's windy, you see the animals also look a bit windy. Windy in the sense that they keep panicking, they keep looking left and right because they cannot see very well, they cannot hear very well because the wind affects their hearing. So kids, you can imagine you are out there and blowing wind, you don't hear very well. Haki, you're asking why do antelopes have crazy horns? In general, it is the males that will have the horns. And they use those crazy horns, as you're calling them, for fighting. It's not a very good thing to do. And it's not that boys should be fighting and not girls. But here in the bush, males will always fight sometimes because of what you call territory, the area they want to protect. And once in a while, they fight over the girls. So the animals will have the horns because they need them to keep fighting. Ryan, that's one of the best questions I've ever had. Do or do they shed their horns? Ryan, they do not shed their horns. And what happens, unlike, like, as they move forward, so Ryan, unlike the deers that I guess you have back home, the antelopes here, once they lose their horns, they're done. So once they're born and they grow, they have that one set of horns. And when that set goes, it would go because of old age. It would go because when they fight, they break them. Or when they're trying to, you know, do something on the ground, they might lose the horns. But when that happens and they lose the horns, that's it, Ryan. And they don't grow them again. Unlike the deers, which will shed horns with time.
Who are you asking? Why do they have stripes on the bottom? And those stripes, for example, like the three stripes we saw in the Impala, they use them to follow each other. So if they're walking in the grass and they lose each other, the one behind will concentrate on those three stripes. And that way, they don't lose each other. And those stripes, we call them follow me sign. So if you're walking in a thicket or in a bush back home, and the one in front of you can see him, and he puts a big flag up like this, so you do not have to worry where you're going. You follow that flag and you not get lost. So that's exactly those stripes are for those animals or for those antelopes. And again, as I said, we call them follow me sign. If you're going to be lucky and see the pumba, the watog running, you're going to see when they run, they got their tails up like that. In another 30 seconds, we shall be coming back to Impalas and we'll show you and we'll show you again those three black stripes on their backs. Just hold them for a minute. The herd and a group of antelopes like this is called an imp is called a herd. And there we are. Just look carefully and you'll notice some of them do not have horns. And all what you see there, those are girls. So the females or the girls, sometimes we also call them females. All right, we have enjoyed seeing those stripes. There's a big male there. Look at the size of the horns. And having those three stripes on the bottom of this one, now we'll take you to another antelope that have a circle on the bottom. I thought you were going to say, I have a stripy bottom, David. But anyways, these are called waterbuck. And I just very quickly want to show you behind them as well. We'll talk about the waterbuck. Remember I was telling you about the impala? Those are the other animals that are just behind the waterbuck. See, they're much smaller. So those are the ones that I was telling you about. So I kept my word today. And I think that is the only promise I'll ever make on a safari, is promise a person that they can see... Uh, an impala. I'm catching a leaf now at my feet. I'm sorry. It was blowing around and making a lot of noise. So those waterbuck, look how nervous they are. You see they look a little bit scared. Uh, and the reason why they look a little bit scared is because it's very, very windy today. And they're very nervous because le uh, all the different animals out here, they normally use their hearing, their ears, to try and listen out for any predators that might be trying to sneak up onto them so you can see they're all huddled together just watching each other now ethan you've asked if the habitat that i'm driving around and is dangerous well no not for me but it is quite dangerous for all these animals and the reason why it is so dangerous is because of all the lions the leopards the hyena the cheetah all the predators all the big cats that want to eat some of these animals so for them it's very dangerous and that's why like i said they have to be very careful and it's nice that they're all watching one another and that there's so many of them because i think if you live by yourself it must be really really stressful to constantly be on alert all the time even just having a little sleep having a nap could mean well the end of your life so they've got to be very very careful but for us we're okay we're fine see the, the cars are big and scary towards the animals so they don't want to eat us or hurt us now Jolia you've asked how long can the Waterbuck's horns get, or well, you can see there, he's actually not a very, well, he's a big waterbuck. That's the boy there. The girls don't get uh, horns, and they can actually get a little bit longer than that. Uh, so, there, yeah, he's, yeah, he's quite small. It's a pity there aren't any, oh, you know what, David, is that another boy over there by that tree on the, uh, to the left of the termite mound? Look, he's bigger. There's, I've just spotted another male. He looks a little bit bigger. He's got nice big horns as well. Oh, wow, look at that. So you see they, they give different shapes and different sizes. But that's quite big. But they can get even longer than that. It's still not the biggest waterbuck I've seen. There's one waterbuck skull that I found. The lions had eaten it. And I took it back to camp. And the horns were basically from my toes almost all the way up uh, to my belly button. So that's how big those horns were. But you can see the impala horns are also a little bit different. But that's beautiful. We're very lucky. There we go. They're very nervous. 
I think we're going to see what else we can find around here. There's lots of cool birds at this dam, so hopefully we'll find some nice ones for you. Let's go to David, who's got a creature with a very long neck. Hey, Kit, you're very lucky. We got one of the, or the tallest animal in the world. You can imagine, you are the luckiest kids I have known in a long time. Let me just move forward by about two meters, and then we'll give you a better view. And again, as I said, we apologize for seeing the pole of the car there, but we do not want to take any chances with, with the rain. Just hang on for a minute. Senzo, let me know when to stop. Okay, kids, just, yeah, just turn around it. We'll it. Okay. <clears throat> just hold on, hold on right there. Like that. Keep coming. Keep coming. All right, kids. Again, we apologize for that, Paul, but just look how lucky you are. You are seeing the tallest animal in the world, and that is a giraffe. I bet most of you, if not all of you, can walk through under that giraffe. Can you believe that? Does it sound even possible? But it is possible. Most of you at your age can walk under that giraffe if you're six, eight years old, roughly. And if you look carefully, as much as it turned, it's a big boy giraffe. Look at the height of that and it's almost tall as a tree. And one of the biggest advantages of this giraffe, they can eat leaves on top of trees. Look, we've got another boy by the name of Luke in the final control and you're asking, what is, can you see it pooping there? You can see it, it has very small poops and they're coming out like pellets. See, very small ones. And you've got some birds trying to, I don't know what they're doing because there's an open bear. That's so funny. These giraffes will have ticks on those very soft uh, spots on where they do the poop. And those birds are rushing now to take advantage of it pooping to get all those ticks. Isn't that not funny? Uh, and those birds are called ox pickers because they peck on the parasites. And coming back to your question, the smallest animal I have seen on safari, and especially here where we are, it is the tree squirrel. There could be smaller ones, but if you're lucky today, we might show you a tree squirrel. It's so small. It's not even more than, a, I would say, 10 inches big. You can imagine. And you'd compare the size of a squirrel with this huge animal here. that's called a giraffe. Maria, you're asking why do giraffes have spots? When the animals are born by Mother Nature, or what sometimes you call evolution, let's say Mother Nature, they're designed differently. But for these giraffes here, the spots will help them to be able to hide in the bushes, what sometimes you say to camouflage. You know when you wear some green jungle jackets and you're walking in the forest or you're doing camping with your parents, you know how you think a polar, a bear or some animal or a deer cannot see you? So if these giraffes, they have those kind of colors, when they stand in the bushes, they tend to blend in. And some of the animals that will always hunt giraffes and kill them and eat them like lions, may not see that kind of reddish or brownish color on the giraffes. We are very lucky. Let's find out Steve is walking, what he is up to now. Well, what you can see in the camera at the moment is a very spiky, thorny plant. And I've got something that I just picked up off of the ground. And I wonder if you boys and girls have any idea what this is. It's not a rugby ball, it's not an American football, and it's not a soccer ball. Let's break it open. <clears throat> wow, it's still a bit wet inside. Mm, it smells... Oh, there's some insects. One or two beetles inside there. It's an entire ecosystem. There's lots of sticks. I'm just going to put this piece down. There's some sticks there. Bark. Some, some leaves. 
You can see a leaf there. Can you see that? Bit of a leaf hasn't been chewed very well. That looks like a berry. Yes, it is. It's a berry. Wow. What could this be? Let's break a little bit more. Let's see what else we find inside here. It's got quite a strong smell, but it's a, it's a damp smell at the moment. Mmm. It's like. Like garden refuse, if you leave it out in the in the garden, you dig in it like compost. Mm, it's almost sweet. So what it is, what it is exactly, boys and girls, is elephant poo. Oh my word! Yes, I stuck my face in elephant poo, and I've broken it up, and it's very easily seen by this orange colour on the outside. You saw Fergus was showing you that tree before. Elephants eat on lots of trees this time of year. You can see the bark. They don't bother with the thorns. The thorns go straight through their mouth. And they eat them as well. And it's not very well eaten, is it? See those sticks? So the elephants are looking for all the nutrients in the bark. And that's how they survive in this time of year. And the orange is because of the trees. So this is a very nice example of a big elephant dropping. Elephant poo. And this is just one. There was about six in the pile but it is an ecosystem you have all sorts of things living in here that franklin that taylor showed you in the beginning likes to scratch in here looking for the beetles and the little insects and the flies likes to eat that and also for some of those seeds that we found in there but we're going to put this back on the ground because it is an ecosystem and slowly over time it's going to turn back into the soil we're going to keep going on here you can see there's a pathway that we've been following we've been looking on the ground for the tracks because on the ground here is a very good sort of area where leopards like to walk so that's where we're keeping our eyes peeled we're going to keep going lots of game trails to check look at what we've got so we just face the other direction now and we're looking into chatwa dam and there's a hippo they love to live in the water and they spend most of their time inside the water keeping nice and cool Oh, there's even an African fish eagle calling in the distance. We'll see if we can see one later. But these hippos, there's a whole lot of them. There's a whole family that's living here. There's loads and loads and loads of them. But I think because it's so windy today, they don't like the wind very much. So they're staying under the water for longer. But soon, it's my favorite time to come back to the dam when the sun is about to set. Because these hippos get really excited. And there are lots of babies here and they play around. Now, Savannah, you've asked how much does a hippo weigh? It depends on lots of different things. Is it a baby hippo? Is it a mom hippo? Is it a dad hippo? But a big male hippo can, well, they can weigh over, about, I'd say about the, about the weight of a small car. So just over a ton and a half to two tons. They can get really, really quite big massive they don't look like they're very big now hey because they're just in the water and you can only see their heads but my goodness they're not also just they're not too tall but they're long they really 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 are long and they're really fat too and they waddle about they're quite funny to watch when they come out of the water and when they start running around when they get scared hippos will normally only run around when they get scared unless you're a baby hippo then you have lots of energy I'm not exactly sure how big the dam is, but look at it. It's massive. It's like a lake. You can see we've got our roofs on, our rain roofs on, because there was some bad weather coming in. It goes all the way to the corner there. So it's really, really big. I don't think it's too deep. I think most of the parts of this dam, uh, maybe I'd be able to stick my arms up and my fingers would reach out of the water. And then there's other places. Like if we look just in front of that tree, there's actually a little sand bank there. So the water is getting less and less because we haven't had any rain and I think there was a bird it might still be a little bird walking around there there is too that's a little three-banded plover now that's actually a very small bird and I bet it is very happy that that little island has has formed because now it can walk in the very shallow water and catch all the little insects on the surface and then also the ones that are in the mud it'll eat those too so that's quite nice. So that just shows us so that the water is starting to get less and less in the dam. It's a very pretty little bird. They're so quick too, they can also run. <laughs> and they are friends with the hippos, as you can see. They don't mind one another.
But those hippos are fast asleep having a big siesta. Anyway, David has got another animal and I don't think that it is sleeping. Yeah, can you imagine even those hippos, two of them can run under this giraffe. As we're saying, even some of you kids can just walk under this giraffe from one side to the other and maybe play some games coming from one side to the other. Now, I told you earlier, this is the tallest animal in the world and I want to hear all of you shouting, which is the tallest animal in the world? I didn't hear. Can you see a bit louder which is the tallest animal in the world? Thank you very much. And also of all the many animals we have in the world and especially here in Africa, giraffes also got very long tongues and also very hard. The surface or the top of the giraffe tongue, it's very hard. And what they are eating there is a bush and it has lots of thorns in it. But those thorns cannot hurt the tongue of the giraffe. Can you imagine? Nathan, you're asking why do giraffes have purple tongues? In general, most animals will have purple tongues, but if you look at it carefully, the part that comes out more, it's a bit dark. And we have always thought it gets burnt by the sun, and the part that is much inside, it remains a bit purple or pink because it doesn't get a lot of sunburn. That's what we think. For them to reach the leaves, they have to move their tongues all the way out and then they have to do anything they can to avoid the thorns because the only thing they feed on are the leaves and not the thorns and not the branches so their interest here in this particular bush are the leaves very good colon you're asking what are the things on top of the giraffe head and you can see senzo is just showing you that Let's call them horns for now. We'll call them horns and they always grow there. And males will have like two big horns like I can see there and a small uh, and a smaller one in front of it. Females will have two small ones and they are not flat like the ones you see here. And on the top of the horns of the females, they like have tufts of hair growing on them. And that's the same bird you are seeing before that we're calling the oxpecker. And what these birds do they'll always bite and remove the ticks. You have seen ticks on cows or ticks on sheep or ticks on goats or sometimes on the horses or donkeys. So here in the African wilderness, we don't remove the ticks from the animals. You can imagine how dangerous it could be. Such a tall animal like this giraffe, it could give you a very big kick. So mother nature has designed a way here like that bird you see the giraffe is getting a bit irritated, but the bird does not stop. It keeps coming back to remove the oxpeckers. Jonathan, you're asking how tall is an adult giraffe, for example? Like the one we have here, it could be anything f about five and a half meters, you can imagine. Five and a half meters, almost, that could be six, maybe 15 feet or almost 17 feet. And a baby giraffe, when they're born, they're about seven feet. And what is interesting, the mother giraffes, when they give birth to the baby giraffes, they give birth while standing. And the babies could be anything between six to seven feet. Full grown ones like this one is about 5.5 meters long. Anything like 15 to 17 feet long. Very, very tall animals. Taller than anybody, any human being you'd think of maybe twice the height of a normal human being. All right, we'll continue enjoying our giraffe here. Let's find out what is happening in the water where Taylor is. We are not going anywhere. I'm so happy to see that the sun has come out though. That was really nice. Look at that bird. What are they doing on those hippos? Careful, you're going to get wet and I don't think you can swim very well. Now, those birds are called oxpeckers and they're red-billed oxpeckers and sometimes they like to use the hippos as rocks so that they can drink water. Oh, hippo, you're going to open your mouth. That would have been nice. You see their big teeth. They also eat the ticks off of the animals. 
Now, Sophia and George, good question from the two of you today. You said, how long do hippos live for in the wild? I would say that the hippo doesn't live more for about 30 years or so. And maybe he'll be lucky to get to that old seat. It's very tough for them out here. And um, again, the hippos often get killed by other hippos, lions, if there's a big enough pride, they all try and take on, uh, on the hippos too. I'm just seeing, I'm watching all the birds. Look how cool these birds are here. You're gonna love these ones. Look at their faces. Look at their beaks. It's like a spoon. Those are called spoon bills. Look how awesome they are. Go, David, go. You know how really difficult that is to try and follow those birds? David is doing an outstanding job. Look at them. Have you ever seen a bird with such a long beak? Oh my goodness, who ever got landing there? And that one, that looks like a snake with its long neck. That one is called an egret, a great white egret. Look at its long toe. What else have you seen, David? And there's another one. There's the spoonbill again. Now, these are some funny looking birds. Like I said, here in South Africa, we've got the coolest birds in the world. I really do think so, especially when they look like that. Now the camera's a little bit shaky because it's so windy today that it's bouncing around every now and then. And they're just resting. <laughs> Maya, you've asked why is there a dead tree in the middle of the water? Well, do you see this dam? I would assume, oh, there's the fish eagle. Look, 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 look at the fish eagle. Oh, I thought it was gonna catch a fish. <laughs> the birds are amazing today. Wow, we're in bird heaven. They're doing all sorts of cool things. I don't know if it was gonna go and try and catch a, catch a hippopotamus, but of course they like to eat fish. Now I've forgotten, what was Maya's question? I've completely forgotten. I got too excited about the... Oh, why is there a dead tree? Yes, why is there a dead tree? So, well, because it, it makes the perfect perch for lots of different birds. So I think they've done some... Now, excavating is another really big word, but when I say excavating, I mean they've come here with big machines and they've been digging. So they've made this dam even bigger. So I think that there are obviously lots and lots of trees growing here when there wasn't all this water around and now it is filled up. So that's why those trees are, are now there. But that tree, when I first started working here, that tree used to stand straight. But now it's tilted to the side, and that's thanks to the hippos. And soon, I don't think that fish eagle's going to have a place to sit in the middle of the dam. And that will be a pity, because fish eagles like to eat fish. And when you can sit on a perch like that, and then swoop down and grab a fish from the water, that's perfect. Hmm. There's lots of things going on. There's also a little blacksmith lapwing down on the ground. Hey, listen. You've asked, how do the hippos sleep in the water? Very easily. That's not very deep there. That's actually quite shallow. Look, you can see how some of the hippos are sort of resting their heads on one another. So they'll find a shallow little bank and they'll just sort of almost sit down in the water. Like I said, they'll just tuck their legs underneath themselves and then they'll use one another as, uh, as rest. So they don't like the deep water, although Hippos will often sit on the shallows on the edge of a bank, but then they'll have the deep water nearby if they feel threatened. If they get scared, then at least they can dive into the deep water and get away from any danger, and they'll feel safer there. But they do prefer the shallow water. Look, you can see one hippo is almost standing now. You see, look how shallow it is. That hippo is now standing up. So it's not too deep. Then on a really cold winter's day, they'll actually come and sit out in the open in the sun. Um. I don't even know where to look anymore. There's so many things to see. Look, the fish eagle's even really struggling to fly in the wind today. That's how windy it is. Wee, up it goes. And around, getting blown around a bit. Where are you going, fish eagle? Wait, careful. See, it's hard when you're such a big bird to even fly. Can you imagine how some of the small birds must be struggling today? They'll get blown all over. Let's see if it's gonna do a swoop over the dam. Let's see. Maybe it's going to try to catch another bird. They don't just eat fish. They do eat other things too. I wonder. I wonder what it's going for. Are you chasing the spoonbills? The spoonbills are trying to keep away from it. From it. They don't want to be anywhere near that fish eagle because sometimes they'll take other birds too. Doing hard work. I think maybe it's going to land now. Maybe on that pole. No, going around again. 
Kingston, this bird has got a, quite a, a big wingspan. It will be about anywhere between 2 to 2.4 meters. So that's really, really big. That's longer than, a, you know, the doorway. So it will be longer than that. That's normally around about, about, what, about 2 meters, just over 2 meters or so. So it will be somewhere around there. This bird is using a lot of energy flying like it is today. Yeah, it's having to flap its wings all the time, so it's going to have to get itself a meal. It is. It's looking for something. See, it's even using the wind now to try and hover. So that will help it a little bit. It will be able to slow it down. But I definitely think it's looking for some fish in the water. It's going round and round and round. It's coming back towards us now. Let's see. Maybe it's seen something in that area. Because that's about the third or fourth time that it's flown right in that same spot. And if it sees a fish, it's got it's really, really uh, adapted for fishing because it hasn't got any feathers on its feet. Come on. And I've never, ever seen a fish eagle grab a fish in the water before. It's getting closer. So if we get to see that today, wow, it's taken me my whole life to see something like that. And I'm feeling really, really lucky too. I'm sure this looks very similar to an eagle that you get at home called the bald eagle. <laughs> Olivia, now you've asked, how do I get my lunch and dinner while I'm on safari? Well, I am not on safari all day long. We do two safaris. We do a, a morning safari, and then we do the afternoon safari, which was the one that you're joining us on now. So and it's, not, it's, not too, it's not too bad. So we go back for breakfast. We have breakfast in camp. We have chefs that make us the most amazing, amazing food. Happiness is uh, with us at the moment. Oh, my goodness. And we just eat everything. And... And then we go home for dinner again, and then we also can help ourselves to lunch. So, and if we do go out all day, we take some food with us. Look at this bird go. This is amazing. This is really cool. Now, I'm, I know you probably want to see lots of other things, but I can't tell you how special it is to watch a bird fly like that. It's really amazing. I can't believe it hasn't stopped once for a rest. Not even once. Off it goes, still going round and round. Mrs. Slater's class, you will ask, well, how is this different from the bald eagle? Well, I've never actually seen a bald eagle before. I've just seen a couple of pictures there. It looks like it landed. I think, no, it's still going. Um, I don't know, do bald, do bald eagles have feathers on their f all the way down to their feet? That would be a difference, because I know for it to be a true eagle, it's supposed to have feathers all the way down, and then just its claws will um, will be showing. But for a fish eagle that eats fish, if it were to fly, 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 and then stick its legs in the water, and then try and catch a fish, it's probably going to do this, and fall, and then get very wet, and they don't want to do that. So by not having any of the feathers, it actually helps them grab the fish really, really nicely. That is so cool. What else have we got? There's all the animals out here today. I didn't think we were going to see too many birds, I must be honest, because of all the wind. And they don't really like it too much. None of the animals really enjoy the wind at all. That spoonbill, I think, is very happy. I think it's just trying to balance at the moment. Yes, well spotted, Isabella. I was wondering when someone was going to ask me about the big things that are hanging from the trees. See, there's a whole lot there. So uh, the big the big brown ones that look like massive Christmas decorations, those are bird nests. And those are from a bird called a red-billed buffalo weaver. There's a tree here. We might see some. I can hear them all chatting. I'd actually just be hiding away today. So those are all nests there, and there's lots and lots of different birds that will be living in the tree. There's some flying back to their nests now. There they go. See those tiny little black birds? Those are the birds that made those big nests. Now, there will be lots of them. They're called red-billed buffalo weavers, and that's because their beak is nice and red. And they, their nest is made out of very, very thorny sticks. And so if something like a snake or another bird tries to go in there, see there's lots of them arriving now, um, hopefully those prickles will, will keep them away and keep them out. That's very nice. That fish eagle's coming back again. I think if we stay and watch this fish eagle for long enough, I think it is definitely going to catch a fish. I really do think so. There it goes. What you gonna catch for us? I 
I wonder how big the wingspan of a bald eagle is. I'm sure it must be about the same. Now, now that bird is tired, very, very tired. But sure, that was some good exercise for the day. Well, that is beautiful. Shall we have one last look at a hippo, David? What do you think? If one will show itself. Now, it's been lots and lots of fun having you all on safari today. And I hope that you enjoyed it just as much as what we all did. So remember to do your homework, brush your teeth, eat your vegetables, and be good at school. I'm sure your teachers will love me for saying that. So a big thank you to Sutherland Elementary, as well as Kempsville Elementary and R.C. Longan. So thank you, guys, and we'll see you all next time. For the rest of you that are going to continue watching, enjoy the bushwalk with Steve. <laughs> sorry about that. I'm sorry that I'm laughing. We found a track just here. Welcome back to all the new viewers. Please send through your questions and comments. Hashtag Safari Live. We got the Herbie Leopard. There's the little one, eh? Okay, so. Just gonna go down here and try and give you the reason why I was laughing. First of all, I'm gonna do that before this track. I was laughing because uh, Luke, the director, said he wanted to come to us, and then Ferg turned around to get a position, and look what he got tangled in. Yeah, a buffalo thorn, and a very cheeky elephant, and he's bleeding. He's definitely bleeding. He's gonna bleed. He nearly knocked me out again with his aerial, but that's all good. And Elephant has destroyed this branch. He's placed it very nice, precariously on the road, on the pathway. He's just been munching the bark there. Isn't that marvelous? This time of year, Elephant just sticks that in his mouth and away he goes. Well, that's a buffalo thorn for another day. And we've got tracks here. Quickly just have a look at this track, if you don't mind. One, two, three. It's tracks of Tundi and Tlalumba just in the drainage room. We're trying to pick up on some of these, but we're gonna try and make head or tail of the direction and uh, where they are. And then let's go to David. He's got a small antelope that they're probably looking for. Yeah, we've seen a very, one of our smallest antelopes here. And this is a steenbok. Steenboks will always be very solitary, very unusual to see two together, unless of course it's a pair, a male and a female. And this is a young male, and very unusual because of its cooperativeness. They are always very skittish, but I think it got itself a very nice bedding space there. It's warming up. It's very windy, and I think because, I would guess, the confusion and all the worries of the wind, you can tell from the grass there. Look at that. Do you see how she just, he just turned? I think his bed is a lot better at being in an open place where he can see himself. It has been very windy since morning and not wanting to take any chances. He is better in a place where he can see himself nicely and he just turned. Look, look at all the trees, how they're moving. And one of the reasons we put roofs on today is because we thought the wind would have brought the rain. You look at the shape or the angle he's putting his ears. It's not took any chances. And Karen, you say, so cute. And I agree with you 100%. He is so cute. He's a young steenbok. And you can see the horns are not very big. They're short, small horns. So he's yet to get those big horns as much as, you know, the steenboks don't have very big horns. But they look tiny and... It got a few either kind of moths or flies there, and they'll always suck the tears from the eyes of this tin box. They kind of either moth or some kind of, you know, flies, and they normally will suck the tears and clean this tin box. And you can see the shape or the angle he's putting his ears. It looks like a scrub here at night. You know how they have the big ears. And one thing I've always liked with the steam box is the shape. If since you can get to the ear, you can see the pattern on the ear. It looks like, you know, someone came and painted that ear. Let's see how this one looks like. Yes. 
baby this is still growing but when you see the fully grown ones you'll see dark and black lines Tony, you're asking where are his parents? I would want to believe now this one has been weaned. And once they are weaned and they are independent and they will live on, the, on themselves, the parents will let them go. And as soon as the male and the female finish mating, normally the male will go on its own way once the female conceives. And then the female will carry the baby once it gives birth, it will take care, take care of it. And once the mother thinks it's time to go, she will quietly leave it and they're going to go live separate ways. So unless you see a very younger one than this, maybe with the mother, the steam box are always alone. Very unusual to see too. But I can tell you they grow very fast, especially the males. The horns you see there they develop very quickly and many times we have uh, you know misidentified you know a mother and a young you know uh, adult growing a young uh, male like a couple a male and a female but just to realize it is you know a youngster of the steam book. and the wind i can tell you is quite a concern today Sorry, what did Megan ask? Very good, sorry, I might have missed your question, uh, Megan, Ali, because of the wind, but your question is, are there any, Afri uh, any animals in Africa or antelopes that have antelopes? I would say no. Most of our antelopes or all our antelopes got horns. I do not know for a fact, I highly doubt, but I haven't heard, Megan, of any antelopes here in Africa that got antlers. So just maybe like the deers could be, you know, I don't know whether you come from Europe or America or Asia, but I would guess the only animals or deers or antelopes I know with antlers will be the deers, which we know will keep shedding them depending on the season or depending on the time of the year. Our antelopes here have got horns, and once they lose them, that's it. Paula, good question. How old do I think this one is? Very difficult to make a guess, but I would say maybe, maybe about getting to about 10 months or going to a year, Paula. But that's a guess. I've not been able to age them very nicely. Um, but my guess would be about 10 months going to a polar, but that's just a guess. And, you know, the, the horns are not very well developed, so he got a long way to become a big boy and become independent where he is. And you can very easily mistake him to be a fawn of an impala. Impala females will always leave their fawn somewhere to keep them safe, but not in this particular position. Karen, I'll confirm that to you in a minute and I'll tell you how long they stay with the mother. Just give me a few seconds and I'll let you know how long they stay with the mothers before they are weaned. Give me a couple of seconds as you continue enjoying the view of that steamboat. So I'm just going to check for you and let you know how long they stay together with the parents before we say or we you know we say when well, they get wind that's when they stop suck, suckling and the parents will tell them it's time to go and live your life and by the virtue of their size they'll tend to stay with the parents for a rather long time and there we are and this is the stain box they will stay with the mother for about three to four months i guess that three to four months before they get wind and after three to four months they'll be on their own and they get to independence anything about a year as i was saying before they're good to go and they're independent and they can live their own lives but three to four months is the period they stay with the months before they get wind whoops something just spoke to there and she just took off that was a great sighting Steam box are always moving. All right, we'll move on and find out what Ford holds for us and maybe find out if he has gone very far from where he was. Let's see whether he has disappeared. The wind has settled down. He's not very far from the road. So, can you see him there? Do you got the pole on the way or is it clear? 
there he is. Now we can see the ears better. You can see what I was talking about before having ears that are quite colorful. I have always liked the pattern on the inside part of the ears scratching themselves itself there, getting itchy. And the wind has died down and maybe now it's getting the confidence to move back to the thickets because Steinbox are browsers. They'll always be feeding on leaves, small twigs, occasionally going for forbs. All right, this is very exciting to see one Steinbock that's not very afraid of us and has given a great show as it continues scratching itself. Now, let's go across to Taylor and get the latest from her. again everybody we um we're just bumbling and waiting i can't go into torchwood unfortunately as there are other vehicles there and we just need to be pa patient i'm hoping they don't decide to have sundown this day because i don't know if i'm honestly going to be able to go to sleep tonight if i do not go back to where the leopard log is because I'm sure we're going to find it there. Okay, for those of you that have no idea what I'm talking about, this morning the animals had a great sense of humour and the sense of humour went as followed. Craig and I were driving, talking about squirrels, obviously, and the next minute we see a leopard in, in the road in front of us and it stops and it looks at us and then races into the drainage line. It was quite skittish, so we try and find this leopard again. We couldn't find it. Now we're driving around looking and I can see there's ma there male leopard tracks on the floor and I'm confused because none of our big males are really skittish except Gajima but this looked like a female from the distance didn't look very big at all so it could have been a young male and which I then later found out that it was and then <laughs> then we were driving trying to still going round and round just hoping that we we're gonna bump into this cat again and somewhere along the line our dear friend Faisal said, what did you just drive past and circled and said, that was a leopard that you went past, Taylor. And then now oh, there's been a big debate on the internet. We then also had female leopard tracks over our tire tracks at some point too. So, I mean, like the animals are just having the greatest time today and they've been laughing at me. So we need to go to that area. I don't know exactly where, I, well, I went and watched and I, I know where I was when that all happened. So uh, and, and we're going to go and see if that log or still then if there's no log there i'm going to get out i'm going to find a track we're going to solve this mystery today but unfortunately i can't go there i'm i'm i'm, I'm unable to go on to torture it right now so that's a little bit frustrating so we want to be patient to try and solve this mystery it, it, i've not stopped thinking about it all day long not it's it's really it's been bothering me so much and then i said to david i was uh, like basically uh, it happens to us all the time. Often we drive past animals. I mean, you can't be looking everywhere. And the only difference is, is that it doesn't happen to everybody else live. It, of course, it's going to happen to me live. Murphy's Law. I, I, get, I always have these kinds of things happen to me. Hello, Impala. Oui. Everyone's very jumpy. We'll just have a quick look. Very, very jumpy at the moment. I don't blame them though with all this wind that's about. Wait, Impala, you can't alarm at me. You see me all the time. That was a very nervous Nelly at Impala Ram. He gave a little snort. He didn't quite like us. Now he's ushering his herd off. Taking them deeper into the thicketed vegetation. Not a bad idea to go in there. Very quiet. Okay, well, let's keep searching. Let's see what else we can find. I'm really just going to linger until we get a chance to go on to torture. And then I have a problem. My radio is turned up so loudly that I can't actually hear what anybody is saying. It's so distorted and that doesn't want to work. I'm pressing the button. Nothing. So I have to kind of turn it off because even when I turn it down here, I can't hear anything. Right, we're going to keep searching. We're going to just drive around and on Chitta for a little bit, see if we missed anything this morning. Maybe something pops up. So off you go to Bushwalk. I'm pretty sure that Steve has been blown around. Yeah, well, we're keeping to the sort of the drainage river depressions. And it appears as if the elephants saw my segment this morning on the medicinal plants of the African weeping wattle. <laughs> which I'm nicely camouflaged in now. 
very freshly fed upon. And look what they've gone for once again. They must have been making maybe a little bit of colic in their belly. Um, in you know, it's a bit of uncomfortable in this. Colic's quite common in horses, so I would I would have no doubt that elephants would suffer a similar sort of ailment from time to time. A huge amount of gas that is exploding up in their tummies all the time in their intestines. I'm sure they get blockages and all sorts of things. So they've chewed on this bark very, very nicely. Clearly they didn't want anything to do with the leaves. So something to do with abdominal pain, chewing on the bark. Maybe inside their belly they're making their own decoction of sorts. There's the bark right there. It's got quite a nice smell actually. Very sweet smell. If I can get past the elephant smell on my fingers. Very, very sweet, 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 sweet smell. I tasted it this morning. You saw my face. It wasn't very nice. So we're going to leave this branch down. And what's also important is elephants do this. They damage, not this area here, but they'll drop it down an area like that. And there is brush packing. Uh, seeds and things will grow underneath that branch that they've used for stomach problems. Now is an ecological tool I find very interesting. Very small disturbances in the wilderness. Me? Well, is that for you, Luke? Yeah, me. Animals are quite smart. You know, I've done permaculture courses. You know, Luke, the director, is asking me a very nice question. I've done a permaculture course, which is basically sustainable living. And chickens, who thinks a chicken is smart? Yeah, well, they are. Luke, uh, Ferg thinks they're smart. If you plant medicinal plants inside a chicken coop or in the area where you've got chickens roaming, when they're feeling ill, they will go and feed on those plants. So if chickens can figure it out, I'm pretty sure elephants and baboons and monkeys know, oh, I'm not feeling very well. We know it. We pass the knowledge on. Elephants pass the knowledge on. Uh, whether all the other antelope and stuff know categorically, I mean, maybe it's just evolution, you know, that that's how they've fed on those things. That's how they've survived. Um, there's a shift into medicinal plants now in the winter time, just like, watch out there, Ferg, just like when we, um, we go into winter, oranges and things become more sort of available, the vitamin C. So we sort of manufacture those for ourselves. But if we lived in the wilderness, we'd start probably harvesting more bark and fruits or bark and roots and things in the dry time. That's what a lot of the animals' diets are shifting to. Obviously, the grazing animals... There's not a huge amount of medicinal value in grasses that I know of. So I think a lot of animals are quite aware that if they come up to a specific tree, they know exactly what that tree is going to give them. I know elephants must be. They teach themselves that. They teach their youngsters exactly how to feed and when to feed and what not to feed on. Because interestingly enough, elephants will not eat poisonous plants. Who taught them that? Well, those who ate it died. It didn't teach their youngsters. And same as us, I suppose. You learn by default. Very good, Monique. Very good. How is the permaculture course going? It's a wonderful course. I'd like to get more involved in that side of stuff, buy some land and grow my own stuff. Very excited to be doing that and have my own medicinal garden, no doubt. So, well, we have moved down into the depression. Um, the tracks of Tundi and Columba seemingly were from last night. Uh, we've moved to try and see if we can find anything fresher. But as of yet, I think we're actually going that way. As of yet, nothing. Sorry, Ferg, I'm running you around in a circle here. Well, we're going to try to get out onto the other side here where the wind is going to pick up. And I'm sure David Gitu is getting blown around all over the place. Uh, not sure what this wind may bring, but uh, I think it's changing all the dynamics of the animals and I when I say the animals maybe the only animals may not be affected by this kind of wind are the big ones. Uh, elephants I think they should be fine with the wind. Just send, try and get that grass there. Just try and point that grass and see. Just slowing down when I spoke of it. But you can tell it was blowing much for I don't know how many nautical miles. Yes you can see that. And most affected animals here will be the small ones. Scott, you're asking, does the wind give the predators an advantage? I would say yes. And I think out of experience, they have known the wind bring a bit of confusion, Scott. 
to the Habibos and like the Steinbock was saying earlier, you'd see he came out in open space. And it's maybe understanding or thinking is, should a predator come and it doesn't pick it up by the ears, it can see it keep turning like 360. So I would say, Scott, the wind gives advantage to the predators. And I have seen once in a while lions moving against the wind towards predators and they must have been, I can remember very well, there were zebras and they got so close and it seemed like a joke because what happened is this lion first stopped thinking, are these real zebras? Because even at about 10 meters, as much as the grass was high, these lions could not see. I mean, these zebras could not see the lions. They were so, so close. They just uh, some mungus there, but just moved. So what I'm saying, yes, it gives them big advantage and they can get so close to their prey and it makes their life easier when they go hunting. And when it's windy, you'll see all the herbivores panicking and moving around. They even stop eating and their ears, if their kudus flicking left, right, you know, just trying to pick any sound because they know very easily they can be brought down by their predators. But again, as I was saying, the big animals like maybe buffaloes, ellies, giraffes, rhinos, I would want to believe the wind will not affect them very much. But anything smaller the size of impalas, I would say kudus, nyalas, thompson gazelles, the grunts, the stainboks, the dikers, you will tell when you see them, when it's very windy, they are always in a panic, you know, panic mode. And you see them looking at each other, going back and forth, and ears, again, as I said, flicking in all directions. And that's the advantage of being a big animal here in the wilderness. So slowly, slowly, I'm heading to the Bufasok waterhole and maybe hoping I'll get something drinking there. A few times I've been there, I haven't seen Ellie's or any other animals coming for a drink. And maybe today could be one of the days I bump into an Ellie or buffaloes drinking. I remember some two weeks or three weeks ago, there's one young bull Ellie that came there and it tossed out. I think there's a hippo there, I don't know what the name is, it's Scuba Steve. And it tossed him out, you know, of the waterhole and the hippo tried to come back and the Ellie stood, you know, on the ground right inside the waterhole there. Luckily, it was not very hot. I wouldn't know what would have happened with that hippo. Sorry, Robert asks what? Sorry, look. Um, Robert, your question is, does the wind help water dwelling predators? Uh, it depends on how you're looking at it, because when it's very windy, I think the animals will even be afraid to go to the water. But the water holds because, unlike the ocean where you'd see the waves, you know, going like that, being big, the water ponds around here, Robert, are always very small, and you didn't see big waves, you know, going in the water. But most likely, I would say the animals will go in the water, and the predators, I doubt they'll get an advantage, Robert, because of the wind. For example, the crocodiles, I highly doubt that will give them an advantage. Very good. We'll be getting very close to the Bufasok waterhole, and let's go to tail and find out what she's telling us. Right, we've got something interesting. There's a cuckoo with these babblers. Just trying to get a view. Can you see the cuckoo? Yeah, that's it there. What cuckoo are you? Are you a levalence? Are you a Jacobin? What cuckoo are you? Let me just quickly check before I I don't ID it correctly. Now, obviously we know the cuckoos are brute parasites, so they don't spend any time raising their youngsters. Looks like a levalence. And I don't know where it's gone now. I can just hear... I can hear the babblers. It's flying with a flock of babblers. So I think it would make sense 
And obviously, the Levalens cuckoo will parasitize the babblers. That's really cool. I've always wanted to see something like that. I've never ever seen it before. Sometimes in, or in the Eastern Cape, it's quite common to see wagtails. Are there, I don't know where it's gone now. I can see odd babbler every now and then. To see the wagtails uh, raising Dedrick's cuckoos, which is quite funny to see. So uh, Interesting. Was it, is it Dedrick's or classes? One of the green ones. Anyway, uh, I've only ever seen pictures of it. I've actually never seen it um, all with my own eyes before. So we're still just bumbling around, hoping to find some more animals and some new tracks. It's also listening to the Game Drive radio. I don't know what's happening. Something about lions. But where? Like I said, I can't really hear what's going on. There's no point me really having it on. I've just got it on, just waiting for Rexon or Taxon to say that they have left Torchwood and then I can go on in. Oh, as it's fairly quiet. Hmm. Hmm. David, which way would you like to go? Straight. Okay. We're going to go straight. Just listening to the Game Drive Radio. So I'm trying to make sense of what's actually going on. Nah. It's a bit difficult to kind of hear. Oh well, I think they've got lion tracks somewhere. I don't know where they're, probably on Bubbles Hook. I'd imagine, are we gonna make it underneath the pile? We good. I always get worried that they've dropped lower and can you imagine that we pulled an entire power line out? That would be terrible. The elephants, I think, have done that. Pushed up against one of the poles. And now leaning to the side slightly. And the weather is bizarre today. So strange. I'm also hoping we'll I don't know what's going on. Look how beautiful it is there. Lovely blue sky. And then when we get to Torchwood, we are going to go up onto the rocks and we're going to, I'm going to show you what it looks like to the south. You won't recognize it. It's like we're in two different places. Let's see. Let's see if there's a gap here. It's not really much of a gap, but look how dark all those clouds are. And there's just like bank of cloud after bank of cloud. They're sort of coming in wave after wave. Awesome. No rain though. No rain just yet. These clouds are sitting quite high. Okay. We're going to keep searching. Hopefully we're going to find some animals that will sit still and entertain us for a little bit. Let's go and see if Bushwalk has managed to find some of the smaller things. Yes, indeed we are on Bushwalk and we're having a marvellous time out here. Ferg's wounds are finally starting to heal. But what we've seen, a battalier, male battalier, has been lurking around this depression here. And is, another one has taken off over there. And to me, battaliers are the most reliable indicators, unless they're nesting, of a kill of some sort. And they would definitely be interested if they found Tundi with some form of meat. How exciting would that be? It could be somewhere just here. It's very, very thick. Lots of long grass. Um, but where she was last night with that Dacre kill was... Somewhere over there, just uh, probably 500 meters or so that way. And then I lost her coming in this direction. And uh, But Herbie's instincts are saying she's probably here somewhere. And the battalier might lead us to it. So let's go. We've been checking these very nice game paths. Very nice game trails. Elephants like to use them as well. Very well worn. Just like the roads. Animals like to use these pathways because it facilitates very quick movement. That's kind of what our roads mimic for them. They think this is uh, the road is a game path. And in some reserves that have planned their roads very well, those roads are all actually natural game paths. You know, Sangeeta, La Bomba, all their roads were very well maintained and, and planned in the beginning. And you'd always find animals following them because those are the natural sort of boundary lines very easy you can see how quickly we can walk through along a pathway and very very quietly but if we're walking through there it'll be a little bit more difficult Paula the sky in this side is actually looking lovely um, it was looking like that earlier but now it's, it's looking quite nice the wind is blowing which direction is it blowing what happened to my scrub hair dung I had a piece of scrub here done. Yeah, it's blowing from the direction of the very bad looking wind. Oh, or, 
or weather. So I think Taylor went out on the roof. She has some thoughts. There might be some precipitation, but Steph's phone app said zero. So I think we're going to be good. I think we're going to be good. But you can normally expect a little bit of weather with, with this wind. But I think it's too windy for there to be any rain. It's just going to blow whatever system is coming completely the other way. That's what I feel. It's generally what happens. We're just scratching around here. Beautiful, beautiful. How's this? We don't get to see much of this out here. Don't get to see much of this out here. Very nice exposed granite rock. Um, all of it is pretty much covered by soil in and around the area. And where we're in a bit of a depression here where the water's eroded away the soil. And you can see these very large quartz crystals in there. Uh, the black that's over here is just probably some lichen, but there'll be feldspar rock. If I tap my knife, that's metal on rock. Metal is not going to displace the rock. Very, very hard. The crystals are enormous, which means that these things actually, the granite came up from underneath the Earth's mantle, and the Earth's surface would have been somewhere up here, and the granite would have come up to about there, and over a very, very, very long period of time, the, the, the oceans and floors of the ocean that were above this rock that solidified under the ground cooled very slowly so the crystals are so big and then slowly over millennia this eroded down or weathered down and that's what exposed these hard rocks and the Sabi sands and somewhere outside of Woodsprate there's some areas where you just see these beautiful rocky outcrops and that is what 2.8 billion years old plus minus that is history right there well, we're going to carry on, see if we can make any head or tail of this battle here. All right, we just came to the Bofus Hawk. We didn't see much, and just the steep scuba over hippo just in the water there, and not much it is doing. Let's see what they can see it from here. The lonely guy always here. There he is. Can you see him, Senzo? Always resting on his own. Hopefully that uh, Ellie doesn't come and toss him out again. And it's very quiet here. I'm not sure the confusion of the wind and great cloud sky there. Well, well done, Senzo. And I am not sure is because the confusion of the wind and you can see even in the water it's picking up a bit the waves it's not the normal way it is so i would wonder what the hippo would be thinking when the waves move as fast or the water has more motion as it is now but it has remained out there as much as the loaders go down and have a nap and then bolt up for a breath but also hippos because of the condition of the wind, it may know it has to stay afloat, ears out, eyes open. Lions have been known to go for them. So out the wind brings total confusion to all the animals. Lots of movement there on the surface of the water. And you let the hippo just continue resting there. We didn't see the Ellie's expected to be here drinking. And we move on, either searching for these big mammals, finding out where they are, or if you could be lucky to see or meet with a cat coming to this water hole for a drink. All right, Senzo, let's move on. Senzo, can we just have a look on the clouds up there to the right before we move on and trying to debate whether these are what we call rain clouds or it's just, look at those clouds there. The wind picks up and the clouds look, they're getting darker and darker. And me and Senzo have agreed, yes, that doesn't mean rain. It could just be clouds building. Look at that, but it's a beautiful sky, yeah? Some oh, it's a silver lining because you have a bit of blue there. But those clouds are very thick. When you think of rain, those are classical examples of clouds that should bring some big storm, maybe much later. But we have not had any thunderstorms or seen any lightning. We'll see how it will go as we move on and see whether the, you know, the wind will slow down and calm down and maybe stop the confusion and get these animals out. 
Sishibul, I agree with you. You know, the weather is keeping the animals hiding because it's quite unusual. I might be wrong, but I don't think sitting bull any early was seen this morning or any buffaloes, which was quite unusual. We'll always be seeing them a lot. And no cats were seen this morning, no leopards, no lions. So if the wind brings confusion even to the prey, and I think also the predators are like, you know, where do you go? It's quite unusual. The morning was very quiet and this game race since we started, not bad. We have seen a few boards here and there, some stain box here and there. But it has been quite knowing how much by now we'll always have seen lots of animals. But at least we were lucky. We had giraffes earlier, we had impalas earlier, we had uh, a wildebeest, and now we just saw the hippo. And of course, Taylor had lots of hippos on the other waterhole. So not bad. But sitting bull, I agree with you, the wind contribute big time i mean uh, in the behavior of the animals just like you if you're walking for example in the forest or in some thickets it will not be the same for you when the wind is calm or when it's windy so you'll go also looking listening because something may happen and you don't pick it up because of the confusion of the wind and wind i would say it's a great weather factor not even to the animals even to human beings. Look at the planes when they're flying, you know? If they have lots of, uh, if the tailwind is pretty strong, you see planes cutting their flight time sometimes by a whole 15 minutes or a whole half an hour. But then if the plane is, play, you know, is going against the wind, they might be delayed by the same period of time because they can't propel against the wind. So I think Mother Nature tells us the wind plays a very important role in the behavior of animals, you know, human beings, and anything else that we do. So wind is very big. And you could see even the birds on top of the trees, like we're trying to watch a few uh, go away birds there, and they just flew, and you see, they all look puffed up, and they look different, and you look at them, they look like birds of prey, but actually they are, they no more go away birds. The tail is kind of missing, the feathers are all out, and I'm sure they're trying with their clothes to hold on the branches for their dear life. So they don't get, you know, blown away by the wind. Nobody wants to be like pew, pushed out of your space. But it bats the big birds of prey like the eagles should be fine. Karen, you're asking, do lions ever wait for the hippos to come out of the water? Yes, they have done that. They have been known to, to do that. And the reason of why they would do that, if they're having a challenge on their prey, or like, you know, they don't have enough, say, zebras, or kudus, or wildebeest, or buffaloes, or other prey they're feeding on, it's not very common for lions to go and hunt or eat hippos but when the situation is tight and i think you know we need to survive we need to live they have been known especially either early morning the few sightings i've seen of you know lion kiss with lion kiss with hippos it's early morning when the hippos are coming back to the water and the lions will tell they've been so used their eyes are still having seen a lot of darkness they're coming down to the water so yes we have seen lions just laying by the side and going for them or when it's getting dark at dusk when they know the hippos are just to come out and of course that time they're hungry they've just been in water and they're only thinking of food 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 and maybe not very strong the lions have been known to pounce on them as much as it doesn't occur very frequently but yes there have been cases Alrighty. Lioness, you're asking what natural disasters occur where I am. Not any that I would be able to say for now, because for example, if we talk about fire, if we have maybe a huge lightning, we have had some lightnings that have caused fire, and when that happens, the you know the lightning will cause fire and that will burn you know the whole area that has happened a few times the other natural disaster lioness i would say the times we get very heavy rains and when you get very heavy rains 
we get flooding and when it floods you get rivers coming up and washing away most of the animals because i would say the only two i would guess natural disasters you get here fire caused by lightning or when it floods and we got animals being washed away from their places just like in east africa and kenya the other day we had lots of rain and lots of flooding that did not only you know hurt the wild animals but also human beings all righty we need to sing a lion Robert, you're asking, you think the wind might affect Mara more than the Juma? Yes, Robert, you are right. And the reason being, in the Mara, we have one very characteristic habitat, the savanna, which is open. And I just want to show you the wind here that's blowing. If you can uh, just punt to those trees there, stay, uh, Senzo, a little bit. So you can see that, Robert, there. If we are back in the Mara, we don't have as much vegetation like what we have here in Juma. We have lots of open spaces, the grasslands or the famous savanna, and you would imagine the wind would be blowing and all animals would be like scattering for themselves and you're trying to get something to hold on. It could be tricky. So any strong wood, wind, I would say it would affect more Mara than where we are here in Juma Romet. Yeah, I agree with you. Very true. All right. Now take your crest to Taylor and she'll give us an update. <sighs> Stressing. I've never stressed. My stump, my heart is sitting in my feet at the moment. It's we're on Torchwood and it's very scary because we've just turned onto Euphorbia Road now. So I promise I'm not looking at the camera once today. Not once while I drive this road until I figure out what happened so we're going to just check here very very carefully to see if we can find a leopard there's definitely what at least one or two leopards in the area because we saw fresh male leopard tracks in the same direction that that one leopard moved off that craig and i saw briefly and then we had female leopard tracks as well over ours uh over our tracks a little bit later on in the drive so something fishy going on around here so we're going to keep searching david are you looking don't pull a Craig on me and also miss the leopard. Craig's really good at spotting. Now, he spots things before me all the time. So is David. It's always like a competition. Manu and I always used to have competitions in the Mara. Uh, and we would see who could spot the animals. So I've just seen a Daker. Is it? Is it? Do you also see that animal, David? Okay, just checking. I know, and I, uh, luckily, I didn't do that because of the black bar. Of course, we've got the roofs on. I'm not going to stop. Off it goes. A little common Daker. You all saw that, though. That was a real animal. Yes? Okay, just checking. <laughs> okay, I'm getting excited. But we're not there yet. This is just where we actually saw the real leopard the first time. We've still got to go, we've got to go onto the other side of the drainage line. And then that's where our leopard slash log search will start. Okay, Ooh, look at all the thatching grass, it's so tall. Ooh, reach out and touch it as you go past. If you don't, sometimes it's, the grass is not very nice. You don't want to get it stuck in your hands. I don't know how much luck we're going to have with tracks though today. It's been, I mean, I really thought that the wind would have stopped blowing by now, but it hasn't. Varchen's fine. The warthogs were walking here. Okay, keep searching. We've got to be careful. We've got to check everywhere because, well, apparently these animals walk right past you. No, Luke, I don't, we don't have a cop. Did you get any of that, David? Ah, okay. So, Faisal, the leopard spotter. Hello, my friend. <laughs> uh, yeah, I suppose animals do get hiccups. My dogs used to get hiccups all the time. Um, I'm trying to think if I've seen any wild animals with hiccups. I've never seen an elephant with hiccups before. I'm, I don't actually, I'm trying to think if, I've rec if I can recall anything specific wild out here, but they do, they do occasionally get hiccups. Okay, this is now where we saw the leopard. So we were here, and then up in front of the road around the bend, this leopard came out. So basically, that is where Craig and I saw the leopard, and that's why it's such a far distance away. And then it went, I guess, sure, that way. So 
And this is where we need to really keep our eyes out. I think I see some tracks on the ground. Let me just check here what's going on. No, those are hyenas from last night. They were running around. Some water buck tracks. Actually, yeah, talk nonsense. The tracks are quite nice yet. So all of a sudden, very sheltered. Looked sort of looking so carefully like I am today. Check again. No. See, this is Kuchava's area though. She likes it in here. We've seen there's Daker around. I don't think that would have been the only Daker either. There'd be plenty around here. Okay. Nothing. Anybody spotted a leopard that we've driven past yet? You, David? No? <laughs> okay. We're still just checking. If I was a leopard, I'd probably be in the drainage systems today, though. It's a nice one down in here. This kind of runs off from the Mulwanini. Lots of warthog burrows in there, too, so another good spot to try and find food. Hukumori should come here. He'll find himself lots of tasty meals. Okay, still just searching. It'd be really nice if we could just get Kuchaba and her cub stepping out on the road. That would be ideal. I'm not getting any of those comms, they're just coming through and then, sorry, Luke, i am obviously got maybe some signal issues with my communication here. I don't know anything you just said. To me. We've got some kudus here, and I have not been seeing kudus, and these ones don't look... Um, can you see the kudus? Can you see the kudus there? Excellent. Look at them. And you can tell, and so, sorry about the gremlins there, and you can tell the kudus also are getting affected by the wind. So instead of being busy, going eating, they're just stopping and moving very slowly. And this is the wind I've been talking about. Don't panic, eat. And as the wind will settle down, they'll start maybe more browsing. Yeah, they are now. They've got a bit of a courage. They have one big advantage being big in size. And like the smaller guys, any, anything, any animal smaller than them, for example, impalas, you know, you think of impalas that size, obviously like the stain box, the dikers, they are more concerned of the wind than the big ones. And the size of kudus going up, as I was saying before, ellies, buffaloes, they should be fine, and the wind will not affect them as much. Because these ones have a better height and they can see better. But I can tell you can even feel the wind in the background. I'm not sure what this will translate to, maybe later tonight. But thankfully, the kudus are still able to eat. With two females there, do not see any male around or any youngsters. But you can tell from the shape of the moving of the ears still, they don't take any chances. We have seen leopards taking advantage of wind like this. Peak, browse, chill. Yes, and you can see the, the angle of the ears. You see, they'll pause as they keep eating. So the ears will face back as much as they're looking in the front. Looking at us, they have to be very certain what's all around them. Thank you very much. You're enjoying. You know, this sighting of all of you viewers, thank you very much. Kudus are always very colorful animals, very colorful antelopes. I do not know where the males would be with a huge rock of horns, which would be making a very good uh, combination of the females here and the branches of these trees in the background. 
for a few seconds, it feels so good when the wind just dies down, eh? You better eat because when it gets windy, there's a time you'll not be able to eat. You'll be more worried of yourselves than, you know, feeding your tummies because of worries of the would-be predators. I've always liked the big ears in proportion to the size of their bodies, just like the giraffes. Huge, beautiful ears. All right, kudos. Keep enjoying. You're browsing. Christian, you're asking, do kudos have a particular breeding time? Not that any that I know, and I think they'll just mate like most of the other antelopes, depending on the time. But I think the ones that got particular breeding time are the impalas. Kudus, I'm not very sure for a fact, but I highly doubt they have a breeding season. Impalas, yes, maybe. Waterbucks, yes, maybe. But kudus, I doubt they have a breeding season. I would say, guess, they do not have a breeding season, unlike the impalas. Right, they're fading away there, going, continuing feeding, and we'll also move on, finding out what is lying ahead of us. Feeling much warmer now. The wind seems to be coming down at the moment, and maybe that might translate to us seeing more game, hopefully. Chloe, you saying, could a could, could a leopard take down a size of that uh, kudu, I highly doubt. I mean, kudus, especially the males are huge. Leopards, a fully grown one would be about, say, 70 kilos, 150, 160 pounds. So I highly doubt. They'll always try and get prey, maybe the largest, their size in terms of body weight, or the small like warthogs, you know, about, say, 40 kilos or... 80 or so pounds but we have seen cases where leopards have brought down kudus very rare that happens the largest prey i've ever seen brought down by a leopard was a topi and topis are huge so stop there keep going and a topi is like double the size that's good a topi is double the size or, or rather double the weight of a leopard and that was the largest prey i've ever seen being brought down by a leopard so i highly doubt they bring the size of this kudu down the other day we saw some cheetahs that brought baby kudu down but yeah this is definitely too big for a leopard and it's not maybe burn so much energy trying to you know, bring down such a big antelope. let's just move forward and see whether they're gonna have a better view of them as they also move with us And maybe we're much closer than before. How is that, Senzo? Keep going. The wind also confuses them a lot. Keep going. Okay. Let's see what it looks from here. Ox pick as usual. This is a very good pose. And you can see their useful ears. And a slight peak of wind also gives them a quick twitch of their heads and they turn to be sure that all is good. Ox pickers, I'm not sure the ox pickers are being affected by the wind. They're more interested on the ticks, on these birds, on these uh, antelopes. And once in a while they go digging some forbs or some little plants on the ground because in general kudus are browsers but they might pick some rhizomes also, any fobs or small little plants on the ground, and then they go back to their normal diet of leaves. Hello. How are you today? I love your ears, but I think, I still think the stain box have better looking ears. Angie, very good comment. They're very good looking. The kudus, I agree with your comment. And also the ears, well, can we say they look like a butterfly? The African monarch butterfly, I don't know.
Yeah, something like that. Or like a moth, some of the largest moths we've got around here. Maybe we should be starting, we should start naming uh, the patterns of these ears of antelopes, depending on what they look like. Now, when we talk of kudus being browsers, you can see that's exactly what they're doing there. Fantastic. All right, now let's go to Steve and find out how his walk is going. The walk is going fantastically well. Um, we've got back to the other side of that drainage. We weren't able to find any fresh activity of Tani. Uh, what we did find is tracks of last night where she came back towards where that day could kill was last night. So we've gone and investigated. She's definitely come back because there's less of it than there was. Or it's possible Hyena found it, but there's nothing there but a couple of bones. So I believe there are some interested people out there that would like a little bit of a quiz. So I've got a beautiful little something in my hand here. Hashtag Safari Live if you know what that is. First one to get it is the winner of the Monday afternoon quiz with Fergus Steve. How's that? That's all I'm going to give you. What is it? Hashtag Safari Live. Looks quite strange, doesn't it? I'm going to hold on to it to see if, see if there's any well-versed people out there. I'm not going to even tell you what it smells like, feels like, sounds like. That is it. Time up. Closing my hand. Okay, so we are going to now start moving towards sort of a bit more south. There were reports of a male leopard tracks in those area. So we're going to go over there and see if maybe we can find any more fresh signs of Tundi, of course. And if... <laughs> Steve, you would think it's some kind of poop. You would think, but it's not. It's not any kind of poop, Steve. So we're going to head that way. Um, it is very windy, so there's no animals in and about. We were thinking Tunny would have been in the drainage, which we checked quite deliberately, but there's no sign. So let's head on that way, and who knows what other wonders we might find. You never know, we might even fall down this termite mound. As we go, it is quite high. Watch out. It's not right. It's not an owl pellet. I picked it because it's quite, because it's quite um, obscure, quite obscure. And it was a very good example, exactly of. Wow. Talking about owl pellets. Ravinda, no, it's not a bugworm skin. But I've got something here. What is this? I don't know what that is. That looks like bone and fur. Now, that is possibly leopard vomit. How glorious. There's a bone in there. A couple shards of bone. Might even be some scat. In fact, I'm going to put that right down, back, make sure I give my pliers a, a thorough rinsing when we get back. As he gets, not a Steve pod. I'm glad I've invoked some thoughts out there though. Owl pellet, um, bagworm, all sorts of interesting kind of things coming out. No, Steve is not a cocoon. Not a cocoon. Interesting. One more, one more look, shall we? P heart is not a dead shrew. Let me give you another angle. There we go. What is it? Joe, there's definitely some lichen on it, but it is not, not the, not the, not the actual thing. Is the lichen? Some lichen growing on it, though. A little bit of lichen on there. Mm hmm. I wonder who's going to get this. Ah, oh, Luke, it might be some kind of bark, some form of bark. Luke might be on the money, but what? What is it? <laughs> Jerry, it's not an Uthika. I'm keeping, even keeping the FC people entertained this afternoon. That's marvelous. 
That's marvelous. Well, keep your guesses coming in. I'm not going to reveal it until someone gets a little bit closer than Luke did there. We might even discuss some, some, some value that it might provide. Watch out, there's a big hole here. This is Aardvark country folks. And uh, you've got to warn the cameraman because they're so focused on the shot. Sometimes, ooh, Bree Bree, you might be, you might be 100% correct there. Do you know what tree it might be? Bree Bree said it is, is it the knob of a tree? Bree Bree is almost 100% correct if she can guess what tree she wins the prize. I'm not sure, quite sure what the prize is right now, but I'm sure Jerry and Luke can think of something. Teresa, no, not hardwood bark, not hardwood, I'm not, um, we don't have a tree called a hardwood here. Bree Bree, okay, here's your, your knob thorn, well done. It is indeed a very large knob from the knob thorn, there you can see the wood underneath, just an extension of the stem itself. The exact purpose of these knobs is very hard to ascertain, you can see there's a bit of a sharp thorn on the end there which gives knob thorn the name it's a nice knob it grows on you can clearly see that it's wooden so I didn't want to show you that beforehand and this one was you generally find the knobs quite large on sort of small young trees of the knob thorn and they think it's to prevent elephants maybe pushing up against them or breaking them when they're very young because um, I mean I broke this off quite easily with my knife with a downward pressure but when these are all very sharp Sticking your nose up against them or your head might be quite difficult to do, but there's no actual answer behind it. But what you can do with these, and I've done it with guests before, you take a file and you, you file down this bark, obviously onto a piece of paper or something, and then you can accumulate it and you can sniff it up your nose and it clears sinuses immediately. Sinusitis, sinus problems, 100% cure right there. I had an American guest years ago who took a whole bag of these home. Shh. Don't tell customs and transport. Well, thank you for participating in our quiz. Let's see if we can... Oh, that was a shocking, shocking hit. I lost. I'm going to go over to Taylor. I'm very nervous because I think we're here. <laughs> I think I'm now looking at the picture, looking at the space, looking at the picture. I think we came round the bend here because I was turning and you can't see the road. And I'm pretty sure it was pretty soon after I'm just matching up. So I'm on Twitter. A little shrub. Oh, yes, I think we're here. Little tree there. Oh no. <laughs> So I think, you see 12 o'clock, Darby, um, the enemy points to you. Yeah, these shrubs here. Look at this. I'm just trying to see. I'm just doing a quick examination. Please, 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 please let it, where's that log? Where is the log? I'm just looking at the angle of the trees to make sure. I think I think we drove past a leopard this morning and you know whose fault is it? It's all of yours because you didn't tell me. You didn't say, Taylor, oh my goodness! Straight away we all left it for too long and then the leopard escaped me. <laughs> okay, let me quickly go forward. I, I totally think though this is where the leopard was. Because it was as we were turning off the road because you don't see the road anymore. Let's look for tracks. I'm getting out the car. Actually, sorry David, I keep forgetting we have the roof on. and. I need to maybe do this. Okay, I'm jumping out. Oh, my earpiece is already out. That's amazing. So I'm just quickly going to check on some of these sandy patches to see if we can find. But I think that this leopard was standing in here. If <laughs> and if I can see a track, I'll be so happy because I just put my mind to rest. So I think it was in here. If I look carefully enough, the light is also not great, so that's not helping me, because I really want to see, though, if it was a leopard. The ground is super hard. Where would you go? I'd probably just walk straight onto the road, hey? That would be my next move. I can't believe I did that live. How do these things always happen to me? Every single time something like that's going to happen, it's going to be me. 
I can't actually see anything. No. Do not. I'm sneaking around the calf. Two seconds. I just want to quickly have a look here. I don't think we're going to see anything though. That's so embarrassing. Not the worst thing I've done though. <laughs> okay, everybody, I think it was a leopard. I think I drove past a leopard lad. Thank you, Faisal, for spotting it and breaking the internet. <laughs> oh no, how terrible. No, I can't. I can remember that moment. Why didn't I see it? Why did I not see the leopard there, the, right there? Um, thank you so much for your forgiveness. <laughs> That's so sweet of all of you. I don't know. I'm checking. I'm just double checking because if I see, maybe the, maybe it was here. It could be here. What about around the corner here? Let's just do a full inspection. Leopard log, where are you? Please be a leopard log somewhere. Awkward. I mean. My dad, when I tell my dad about this story, when I go home, I'll show him the whole video and everything. He's going to never, ever let me live it down. Maybe I shouldn't tell him, but I, it's a funny story. I think it's quite humorous. And I suppose, hey, you're gonna take the good out of things like that. No leopard logs here. That's for sure. I'm pretty certain that's, that's the spot there. May, I don't know if it was the same leopard that we'd, you know, initially seen, because that's sort of the way that it was running. Could have just done a big loop. Then I don't know who it is, though. But that leopard did not seem skittish at all. We drove right past it and didn't do anything. Didn't flinch. Just froze. Used the freeze technique. <sighs> Very embarrassing, but oh well. Okay, I've got some other good news for you though. We picked up on fresh female leopard tracks, very fresh female leopard tracks, on top of all of our tracks from this morning. The tracks were not there, but the problem is, is that I think they turn off and go into a drainage line. I might at some point actually have to get off the car and go and have a little look and see, but we'll just keep our eyes open, obviously, and keep checking around here. So I think she's she she might even have a kill because I haven't really seen any more of the cub tracks. I've just been seeing her tracks going up down. So either she's been out hunting and she hasn't been successful, and maybe she's just sitting down somewhere, or or she's got a kill and she's maybe just coming for a drink of water and going back. And that's when we, well, I don't know. It's all a mystery to me. <laughs> Oh, that's funny. Okay, I'm losing communication again, but I think it's just my radio. I'm not sure who I'm sending you to, but hopefully they're going to have a laugh at my very awkward situation. Well, Taylor, I think that debate will continue for a long time. Was it a leopard or was it a log? Was it something living? or something not living. Senzo, what is your take on that? Was it a leopard or a log? Senzo, give me an answer. I'd see whether it was a log or a leopard. What do you think it was? Don't laugh, Senzo. I'm asking Senzo a very pertinent question, a very important question, and I didn't answer whether what was seen this morning by Taylor was a log or a leopard, and he's just laughing. Can be you a bit serious, Senzo? What do you think? Was it a log or a leopard? Well, Senzo is telling me to give you all the viewers that question, and you tell us whether <laughs> it doesn't. It doesn't go like that, Senzo. You give us an answer, then we all know. Anyhow, uh, as I said earlier, this is going to be a very big debate, uh, even among us as guides and uh, all the camera uh, operators and maybe the whole staff. You know, back in the camp, whether surely that was a leopard or a log. And personally, I do not know what to say for now. I'd want to see uh, what happened again. I'll answer when I'm closing my eyes like that. And I don't know what Hila thinks. Anyhow, the wind has come down. Let's first go back to Taylor. My signal could be fitting.
don't know. I can just hear the radio beeping. Okay. Oh, you're not even getting beeps. Ooh, hello. No, I don't know. I can just hear beeps, but I don't know if it's the Game Drive radio because I've got that on as well. And sometimes that makes interesting sounds. Okay. Sorry about whatever happened to that side. Some um, probably signal issues with Noah, uh, with uh, Taylor in Torchwood. Don't worry, we are here. We're on foot still. It's opened up a bit. The wind is still still pumping, but no no signs, tracks. That's all good. What's going on here? Little sickle bush has been infested by something. The sickle bush, you can see by the leaves, very similar to the plants I did this morning. Here are the very sharp spines to indicate sickle bush. And something has taken all this leaf and created a, a cocoon-like. There's more than one. Oh, I wonder what that is. I've never seen anything like that before. I wonder if any of you folks back home have seen the sickle bush decimates like this. It's very likely some form of leaf rolling caterpillar or spider perhaps. That is but by the way that the, the plant is completely decimated. I just I couldn't really tell you to be honest. I wonder how many of you out there are experts in this sort of thing. Tell me what that is. Hashtag Safari Live, let us know. You seen that before, Ferg? Yeah. Clearly been munched. I mean the leaves are clearly broken off at the bottom there. And they've been wrapped wrapped into sort of a cocoon. There's a little bit of silk there that I can see. But I'm not going to damage damage it in the just so that we can um, see what's inside. So send your screenshots through. Who knows? Marvelous though. All good. Beautiful. <laughs> Watch out. Watch out Ferg. Do have the sun setting. Steve, I don't know if it's a spider or a caterpillar. By the way that the leaves have been brought to that one section makes me think it's a spider. But I don't know. I really don't know. I'm learning lots and lots about things the insect world these days. Beautiful in the background. You're getting that, Ferg? Is it a little, is it a bit too bright still? The sun. The sun's a bit too bright. Beautiful in the waving grass. Beautiful afternoon. Just have a moment with that, shall we? Yes, Paula. I'll just give you all a moment to take that in. We had a moment this morning with the sunrise. Let's do it again as the sun goes down. Definitely some form of system building up off of the east coast. Mozambican current is doing something very strange this time of year. Just be getting this front pulling in. But it is marvelous because it's bringing in the clouds this time of year. You don't often see too many clouds because there's not much sort of moisture evaporation. But they're being pushed in from, from far away when obviously the water is evaporating from the ocean. Some cyclone system probably developing, pushing it all in. Yes, Brenda, very, very peaceful. And we're out in it. Some birds calling in the background, the crested Franklin. Shouting, not an alarm call. There were some grey hornbills. It's pretty still though, apart from the wind. Most animals are hiding, most birds are keeping sort of quiet. We're going to continue on though. See what else we come across. We're up on top of the Katina. This is an area I had Tingana a little while ago and uh, very very sandy soil up here. Very very sandy soil and uh, lots of digging. 
we, we passed quite a few sort of uh, diggings from Aardvark and it's an area you have to be very careful driving off road because you can quite easily lose your front wheel and obviously the, they are looking for termites there's quite a nice large termite mound over there but here's one of the diggings I'm talking about you can clearly see there's a big hole in the ground not the biggest of holes but big enough and look how all that leaf material is catching in there grass seeds all sorts it's quite soft see how nice and soft it is I know I talk about this a lot but compare that to that piece over there very very hard in there's very soft um, all sorts of plant seeds might germinate nice little hot spots a little bit shaded and also a bit more accumulation of water also it's been dug out a certain amount and something could come along and dig it out even further so part and parcel of what aardvarks do out here also the soil that's been deposited on the outside has maybe got a few more nutrients in it in and around so those ecosystem engineers doing their thing hello Connor doing a BSc in conservation that's very good tips for getting into this line of work well presenting or to actually guiding guiding you know there's a number of companies you can you can just do a Google search and find out how to do a, a guiding qualification in South Africa we're pretty much Southern Africa related the stuff that we do down here um, but with ecology or with a conservation degree behind you that puts you in very good stead to do this sort of thing I've got a master's in conservation I've worked with quite a few people in the past who have done conservation then got into guiding and you know it seems to be the way you know I mean a lot of people do a conservation degree because they love animals um, a lot of people do a conservation degree that don't like people so if you like people then becoming a guide is a good job if you don't like people it's not the right field for you um, maybe being a presenter though might be you have to deal with people like Ferg though, every now and again which can be a little bit sh <laughs> Okay, Ferg's a wonderful guy, but if you're a people's person, you like the environment, becoming a guide is 100% good idea to do. But if you're not a people's person and you just like the wilderness, the plants, the animals, then you want to get into conservation primarily where you don't have to deal with too many people. But if in conservation, watch out there, Ferg, that's a sickle bush. But if you're in conservation, you might have to deal with landowners, and landowners can sometimes be with their own pieces of land in and around that can be very, quite difficult as well because they think they've got conservation degrees when they don't but uh, we're going to continue on with a beautiful sunset in the background well yes i think now it's time to enjoy the sun going down and also find out which animals will be coming up it's been rather quiet but the good news are the wind seems to be settling down and if that happens chances are we'll start seeing a lot of movement which is what you've been waiting for the wind blows and everything sorry uh, my game drive radio was a bit loud everything gets very confused even the birds that we we'll normally see around this time around they're not going to be seen we have seen most of them holding for their dear lives on the branches not to be blown away but i would imagine the big ones like the vultures you know or the big birds of prey the raptors like the snake eagles or martial eagles you know or the vultures would be around and not being affected by the wind maybe you might be seeing some nice roller there do you think we can do that uh, from the uh, from that angle says so do you see that roller there is that a good position so do i move forward a bit or turn around okay we got some that's good there's a roller there and that might be of a better position and it doesn't look being blown by the wind and beautiful sky if you look carefully there at least with a roller there and if you compare this to the go away but we saw earlier this one looks to be at home yes it's a lilac breasted roller And you could see, maybe it's a bit of silhouette now, but that's the lilac breasted roller, a bit still being blown a bit by the wind. And you can tell from the tail feathers, they keep moving, and definitely that's not the roller moving itself. It's trying to get its balance. 
if you'd compared how it was before, this is much, a lot better. Hoping whether he'll be coming down. Yes, that's better. Thank you, Senzo. And you can see why they call lilac versus rollers. You can see a bit of lilac there. The blue. And away it goes. Leaving us with some beautiful sky. That's great sky there with the Dutch tree where that roller was. Excellent. And hopefully should be seeing some great sunset later in the day. Isn't that wonderful? So what do we move on now and hold on to our luck as I'm very convinced in my heart now with the wind having gone down, all the animals should be moving. The other day we had a song that we invented with Senzo about leopards. And I don't know whether we are going to sing that song today or we are going to sing a different one. It should be a good time now for the animals to move. The elephants also have been quite elusive. Uh, what is the question of the viewer? And what's the question, sorry, name of the viewer? Tesla, you're asking what's the biggest prey I've seen being taken down by wild dogs. And I would say it was a zebra. A zebra? And the only sad part of it is how they brought that zebra down. Because I don't know, Tesla, you've seen how wild dogs will hunt. They're a bit crude, I would say, and they're a bit cruel how they bring the animals down. And they'll give them chase, and you know they can run for a long time. And once the prey gets sad, if it stops, unlike lions or leopards that will use their canine teeth, you know, to suffocate these animals and kill them, the wild dogs start biting the animal from any angle, any point, any part of the body. And that's a huge trauma for any animal. You're so tired, you have been running, you're still suffering, you know, trying to get oxygen, and then these animals, you know, bite you, definitely they give a lot of trauma. So the largest antelope or the largest prey I've seen being brought down by wild dogs was the zebra. That's way back some two years ago. Otherwise, ideally, they'll go for smaller, you know, smaller animals like impalas, very quickly feed on them. If they don't get enough, maybe they go for another one. But yeah, the largest I've ever seen wild dogs bringing down was the zebra. We saw a huge pack the other day of about eight of them around here. And we, have, we haven't seen them for the last uh, maybe 10 days now. They definitely must have moved to a different area. Always so exciting to watch wild dogs. And when you compare them to the jackals and the foxes, you'd see how resilient they are in terms of their hunting habits. I like the jackals or the foxes. Always moving in big groups, moving as a pack. And that's the strength. Such trees are always very good to see. Olets. Minamu, that's a very interesting question. And you're asking where are all the buffaloes? And the buffaloes must have moved a lot. And the last I saw was a big male buffalo that moved, which was about two weeks ago in a waterhole but I haven't been able to see the big herds. But what they'll do because of the big numbers and they eat a lot and know their bulk eaters, they always move from one area to another. So they definitely must be in a different uh, uh, property in Amu, and maybe sooner or later, they'll be coming back and we'll be seeing 20, 30 or 40 of them together. What will not move the big herds, the females and the young ones, are the big bulls, Minamu. And the big bulls will always tend to remain in particular areas, stick around. One, because of their age, and as they get older, they don't want to keep the pace, you know, of moving with the young females. And occasionally we have seen the young females sometimes trying to get rid of the males when they get old. They're the only animals I think, or the big hobby was I think, when the males get a bit tired, you know, the males are shown the door by the females. And you're so used to living with females and young ones in your life, and one minute you're shown the door. That makes some of the males, buffaloes, very grumpy. So certain areas in Africa, you have had 
or we have seen buffaloes killing very many people or hurting many people together with the hippos. And if we look at the statistics, it's more of the male buffaloes that has done or that, that do more harm than the females because they get very grumpy. Hopefully they'll be coming back around this area pretty soon. All right, he's still keep looking and we'll always have our eyes again on the ground for any trucks for leopards or lions and maybe also looking forward for a beautiful sunset at one point so if we move in the different direction round we might see a beautiful sunset and again it's hey good news the winds have died down and Something tells me we should be seeing animals now coming out. If impala start coming out because they're not being affected by the wind, maybe also leopards will start coming out. We're just crossing fingers and uh, looking forward. We can see some beautiful sunsets moving, coming up about 12 o'clock from where we are. I'd be more than happy to have a view of that sun going down. Senzo, let me know when to stop because that looks very colorful and that is the western horizon and there's nothing as good as seeing a sunrise or a sunset in the African wilderness. We're getting a very nice angle, we're coming up a nice opening. And again, as I said, we have a little challenge today because of having the roof on. We do not want to take any chances with rain. How is that, Senzo? That looks good. Senzo thinks we have a good view there. And also, as we watch that, I'll be listening to all the calls of the birds or see if I could hear any leopard sowing. And what marvelous sky on the western horizon. And what we're hearing now, a bus chipping. Thank you very much, looks is get very nice. Great sky there. And there's nothing else you'd ask better than seeing such a beautiful sky in Africa. Sean, you're asking, do the ox pickers ever alarm call? I will tell you for a fact, I am not sure I've had ox pickers alarming. Can I remember? Not really, Sean. I apologize because I don't know whether ox pickers do alarm call. Maybe they do, maybe they don't, but I can't remember. I have never seen them. Maybe alarm calling, but I think my biggest, you know, lead for alarm calls will be the go away birds and the Franklins. They might, who knows, but I haven't had personally. I'll not tell you for a fact if they do it or not. As the time is going and we have enjoyed having that view of the sunset, let's go to Steve, who is doing the walk. Yes, we are. We almost, well, we are arriving at Vuyatela Dam, Vuyatela Watering Hole. Normally, a hive of activity. It is extremely quiet at the moment, or as the tree would indicate, dead quiet. <laughs> That's my one joke for the day. I've got with me here, folks. There he is, the characteristic Herbie wave. So this is the dam where quite often we find multitudes of animals in the middle here. First of all, Jager, I'll stop. Hey, Herbie, what do we do? You're going to demonstrate. You're going to be the lion. Okay, Herbie and I are going to walk towards you. Just stay right there, Ferg. Stay right there, Fig. Jager, we're going to show you exactly what what happens if, if you're the lion. Okay. Herbie's going to be in front. Herbie, you're going to go through the, exactly the drill that you do. And you even have to shout if you want to. Do exactly what you do. There's the lion. No, we just see a lion. Then we'll see what they say if it charges. Let's go. You're watching closely. This is Herbie in his, in his element. There's the lion. Freeze. See that hand? That means freeze. It's pointing out the lion. Now what's next, Herbie? Depends if it's charging. I feel like I want to run, Herbie. 
That means freeze, eh? Okay, Herbie's now shouting. He's now shouting at the lion. And I don't know if you noticed there, Herbie's maintaining eye contact, looking at the lion, shouting, making sure as well by looking over his shoulder that I'm not running away. And invariably, because of that, the lion doesn't charge. Okay, so, but then what do we do, Herbie? It's not charging, eh? Yeah. But the lion's kind of moving back. Okay. So now we're going backwards. We're keeping looking at the, the lion. We're moving backwards. Never turning any shoulder. No one's ever doing this. What happens if I do that, Herbie? If I turn and run? Hey. If I turn my shoulder and run, folks, that lion is going to charge and it's going to run straight past Herbie and it's going to jump on my back. So never, ever, ever, ever do you run. Stand your ground. You'll see the lion might be there. You might have to freeze multiple times. Multiple times the lion might move forward. You'll stop. You'll shout. Whatever you want to say. You quite often find very rude words come out of your mouth in this situation. Afterwards, you can apologize to your guests for the language that was used. And sometimes it can take 15 minutes, 20 minutes to eventually get back and away. Eventually, the lion will realize you're far enough away from it, and then you can leave. Go and sit down there. Um, we often have an extra pair of underpants in the bag, which you'll need to change after that. And then you get the color back to your face. And then most important thing that you do, most important thing, you sit down with the people. You make sure everybody's okay. You make sure everybody's on the same page. Make sure everyone's okay. Uh, confirm with them that their health is good, their fear is good. Because sometimes you just see a lion and runs away. But sometimes you go through the 15, 20-minute situation of that lion being very, very sort of in your face. And that is a different situation. But a lion just running away wasn't too dangerous, but your guest might for the next 45 minutes on the walk be wanting to die. You need to tell him, don't worry, it's okay. We're okay, we're okay, you know. But you need to communicate that now, not let your lodge manager later when old Fred or whatever his name is doesn't come to dinner find out that he was terrified nearly had eaten today. You need to talk about that sort of stuff. So Herbie, come, we're going to go into the dam and we're going to send you back over to Taylor. Hello. We're off of Torchwood. Torchwood is, um, the signal is not great in Wendy, so we've decided to come back this way and, well, start scratching around. Hopefully we're going to get a leopard. That'll be nice. A real one this time. So that's going to be the mission now. I heard some rumblings about lions on Biffle's Hook. I don't know what lions they are. It sounds like it's a pride, but they, sound, well, they seem to be quite skittish. So I wonder if the Torchwood pride has ventured on back. Um, I, I know every now and then uh, they can be a little bit nervous. I mean, I think they go for ages and at, at times without seeing cars. I think when they do go a couple of weeks or a few days without seeing the vehicles, they're a little bit nervous. Um, but I will find out tonight what lions were seen so mm, we're not going to go down ledward i think we might i'm also not sure where steve said he had tiny tracks i know it was particularly difficult because of course with all the wind we don't really know what's what and and when those tracks were laid down in the sand but i want to just check some of her favorite areas anyway might as well take a little bit of a gamble and if it, that gamble doesn't play out for us here then we will go all the way down to the west and check around that side as well see if anybody's well got up and started walking our way i haven't heard any any updates just yet about animals i think it's been particularly quiet all over so everyone's Everyone's having a quiet drive like we are. Although David's been saving the show with all sorts of things. I've hardly seen anything. I did see one warthog and some more waterbuck, but we didn't have any signals. I couldn't show you. It may have been Wilbur the warthog too, the one, the big old fella with uh, the missing tuft of his tail. Looked like him, but I only saw him from the front. He had a big set of tusks on him. Shall we go down this one? Yes, let's try. Did you see a hyena? Oh yes, we saw a hyena. Yes, okay, so we I lied. We saw a hyena as well. Um, it disappeared into the bushes. It was very light in colour. It looked like it had been to the salon and had a, had its hair done. It was bleached. Um, it walked off into the thicket, though, so we, we couldn't follow after it. Um, 
Child of the Universe, I, I don't know if I can find lions. If there's lions on the property, maybe, if I don't drive past them, maybe. But uh, I haven't heard any rumblings of anybody picking up on any lion tracks, not this morning. So unless somebody decides to, you know, make a turn onto the property now, then maybe there's a chance. That's why it would be good to go and check in the West, hey? because we know that, well, Amber Eyes has got suckle marks and... She's definitely got cubs. How many cubs? We still don't know. No one has still actually seen them, but she's been separating herself from the pride. And there's often one set of lioness tracks going in that direction. This morning there were leopard tracks around here, but they look like male leopard tracks to me. Do we go? Darby, what are we going to do? We're going to go up Drakensberg or we're going to go all the way down Mamba? What do you think? Drakensberg. Let's go up. Let's go this way. Good call. Could do a little side lighting here. <gasps> Don't you say such terrible things like that. Of course, Wilbur was not one of the warthogs that got eaten by a leopard. I hope not. Or one of the lions. I think that Luke maybe means the lions because the lions recently caught uh, warthogs, but we didn't see who they were. The other, the, the ones that Hukamori caught. Um, way too far away for Wilbur's uh, sort of home turf. Wilbur, the warthog, lives between Chitwa and also, I wouldn't be surprised if he snuck into Torchwood. And then what? Have, and then this sort of southeastern corner of Juma as well. He likes it around there, so that's where he sort of lives. Um, I suppose we can do, maybe try to find some owls. Who's sitting up top on that tree? Some birdies. I don't know if we're going to be able to get. Oh no, we will. I can just see the silhouette of something that looks like it's about to fly. What are you? Are you a red-billed buffalo weaver? No? Are you a southern black flycatcher? Uh, is it a starling? <laughs> I'm trying to identify it now just because obviously it's, it's very difficult to see. I don't know, it's definitely... What does everyone think that is? There's something down below it as well, Davi. I wonder if that's the same kind of bird. Looks, maybe it's a starling. There we go. What's, what are you? Yeah, they do. Probably some some Cape glossy starlings. I did, there was a third one that flew off, though. That would make a lot of sense because they're fairly gregarious birds. And that's one of the tough things out here is not only do you have to identify a bird when you've actually got a clear view of it, but sometimes you have to try and identify birds like this, just the silhouette. Then you've got to look at the shape of the beak, you know, well, their sort of feet, their legs, and how long their tail is in proportion to their body. And there we go. That just gave it away. That one just sang a beautiful tune. And that is indeed a Cape Glossy Starling. So there was a whole group of them. Very nice, quite difficult, but a beautiful view, don't you think? Child of the Universe, I th I wouldn't, I'm gonna go with birds like Franklin's, ground, ground dwelling birds. So Franklin, spur files, guinea fowl, I think they suffer the most from predation. Uh, whenever I ever see any eagles on kills and it's been a bird, it's typically either a guinea fowl, a crested Franklin, or uh, you know, something along those lines. So I, yeah, I'm gonna go and say that it's probably, probably them. But, um, I mean, again, then you get things like, you know, some of the falcons that will catch birds in, in the air. So then doves that are not particularly fast flying, of course, become a target too. Uh, so a variety of birds, but I think I'm going to go with probably the ground bending ones. I think they're, they're quite vulnerable. Although they can duck underneath shrubs, you just got to hope that you're quick enough. And then a variety of chicks. I feel like all bird chicks are vulnerable when they're, well, when they've just hatched, even when their eggs, well, they don't even make it to hatching. They get eaten by all sorts of things. So, so yeah. What else are we going to do? Okay, let's see if we can't, we've been having so much luck with pearl spotted owlets lately. Let's try to find a barred owlet. So I think we're going to go all the way up Drakensberg. So we're on Drakensberg North now, going towards Quarry Pan. And I think we're going to go down in Yala Road, North and South. Because I also wouldn't mind trying to find the white face, Southern white face Scots owls that I've seen before. And um, that would be a very nice treat. We don't get to see them very often at all. But my spotlight might be able to help me. Hello, MPs. MPD Impalas. 
Yes, I know you're gonna run from me. I'm, I'm so scary. That's when you know when even even when the impala are a little bit jumpy like this, moving away. Normally they don't move anywhere. They just stand around and watch you. Oh, there you go. Well, my boys, be safe out there. Tundi likes to lurk around here. Oh, I found a chameleon last night. How cool was that? Did not expect to find a chameleon. That was a really big one too. And uh, that was nice on my drive, uh, on our drive. Uh, yeah, I was actually really shocked. So maybe there's hope, but it is quite freezing tonight. Anyways, we're gonna keep on searching. I think we're gonna do an owl drive tonight. I'm gonna send you to David to see what he critters he'll be searching for this evening. I think this is the hour now for all of us to start thinking and behaving like the nocturnal animals. And I'm debating, do I start thinking like a scrub hair or do I start thinking like an owl, as Taylor is talking about owls, or maybe a nature? I want to start thinking like, uh, let me see, a scrub hair. A scrub is much better because this could be any time now we start seeing scrub hairs coming out and net just also coming on the road. Leopards also, being also, you know, Diano and Nocturnal, they have given us quite a good miss from yesterday. Not wanting to mention the big debate with Taylor's would be Leopard. So let's see if we can see a real one now and that will be straightforward and there'll be no debate about it, whether it is a log or a Leopard. All right, and uh, we just got an update there. So we're gonna try fast and fly low to the dump camp and find out what could be happening. We are not very far from there and see if that leopard is right there. So we're gonna do a bit of flowery safari. You'll excuse me. We are very close to that place. We're gonna drive a bit fast. And then we're gonna see whether we can get the that leopard there, they have been giving us a miss from yesterday, so you're going to take every shortcut possible now, and you'll find out whether we are going to see it. So this could be a bit of Ferrari safari. I'm always one easy, slow driver, but maybe I'll just drive a bit fast. Sense are you holding on? So the thing is, it's not the same David you know. I'm always trying to be gentle on the road, or when I do wood washing, when I'm driving off the road, I always try to be very gentle. Of course, not always. But let's find out if we'll get that leopard by the dump camp. And the moment it's out of that lens, we don't know which direction it will go. But allow me to drive fast. It's very windy. If you don't hear me talking, I don't want to lose my hat. So I'm holding my dear hat. But as I do the Ferrari safari, let's go to Taylor. Hi, Taylor. Right, now, I think that my Ferrari safari versus David's Ferrari safari is very different. I can imagine him. This is what I said to David just now. And I just have a good chuckle because I'm going to tell you a funny story. I can imagine this is David. David's getting ready. He's like, okay, leopard, let's go. Hold on, David, let's. <laughs> no, I'm just joking. <laughs> But I can't imagine our dear David racing around like a, like a hooligan, like you know how I behave sometimes, or like when we're chasing after wild dogs or whatever it may be. I just, I cannot picture him doing it. Um, kudos if he does though, that would be impressive. David, you've never, you've never been on a proper Ferrari safari, hey? Uh, with no, with me, yes, we've, we've almost. So we're having a good chuckle. So I have a story to tell you. One day, and I couldn't stop laughing. Uh, we're driving up this really steep hill. This was years ago. And uh, anyway, it's driving an old car and a part of the vehicle underneath just, well, it fell out. So I could not drive the car anymore. So I had to get rescued. So another another guide by the name of Timber, he's so great. Um, he was, it was so awesome down, down in the Eastern Cape. 
and <laughs> so he comes he collects us all my guests get in the car now we're going now it's just about to start raining like typical w winter in the eastern cape and the next minute he says he turns around to all of us he stops and he goes right everybody we're going to be traveling a little bit faster than we normally do to obviously try and avoid the rain. Meantime, my guess, we've been racing after all sorts of things the whole time. And he says, we're going to go. Here we go. And off we went. And I like, was like, sure, bra braced myself getting ready. We only, we only went about, I don't know, maybe into second gear. And he was like, that's, he hasn't been driving that fast. So I had a good chuckle. I was like, oh, that's like my normal speed. Anyways, let's send you to, well, Steve, because it's getting dark, and I think he's going to have to go home soon. Looks like Hukumuri, folks. There he walks. David's moving into the area. Go, David. Go, David. He's going he's gonna to walk right in front of Weatella Lodge. David can just find his gear there. Looked like Hukumuri to me, but I looked at him in my binoculars. He's got that very sort of characteristic look. He looks straight through my soul. It's fantastic. Looks like David's going to be with him in a moment. Go, David. He's right there, 50 meters in front of you. Go straight, David. Go straight. Go straight, David. Just follow that game path. Herbie's trying to communicate with him. They haven't seen him yet. Okay, well... We're gonna we're gonna leave David to it. He just has to just move a bit further forward there. Okay, looks like they're just changing their camera, changing their light. Looks like we gonna have to try keep our eyes on Hukumuri a little bit longer. I think it was Hukumuri. Did you get a good focus on him there, Fergie? You thought so as well. I wonder if what the viewers thought back home. Yes, I'm finally learning these guys' faces. He's got the one. So, um, Herbie's going to talk to uh, David about him going straight into the drainage there. That's where he had the cheetah the other day on that kill. He should find him soon. He just follows the alarm calls. How exciting is that? Now, we were sitting here earlier doing our little lion demonstration. And uh, we heard something in the distance, and we thought, oh, maybe we should just wait here and see who comes through. And it started getting dark, and we thought, well, let's head back. And you never know what you're going to see. So fantastic. Thanks, whoever was watching the damn cam. I have no doubt we're going to be going with David shortly. Has he got him, Herbs? Looks like David's got him, so we're going to leave you to that. And we're going to say goodnight from the Bushwalk team. Have a fantastic, fantastic evening, Herbie. Oh, there we go, my man. Okay, we might have seen a leopard here. We getting very close to it, and just one minute, I confirm to my friends. It is Ingwe, Ingwe. Can you sit right there, Senzo? It's just marking territory there. We're very lucky to see. A leopard here. We are very, very lucky. So it says I've got nothing on my monitor. Just marked territory there, just moving. Sorry, I've seen you got a picture. My monitor is blank. And now we have gone to infrared to follow this leopard. Hukumuri slowly, slowly. So let's just go around and we don't miss it. So by going to infrared, we make sure we don't, you know, influence it or affect it by too much light. So we slowly going to follow it and find out if we should go to Galagopan to have a drink. And all the birds are going a little crazy now because they can see it. Let's get a little opening here. Um, Linda, thank you very much for your congratulatory message. Thank you so very much. And you can hear even the monkeys now are going crazy. So let's get, get close. It's on our right here. Stop there. OK. 
clean that there we are. And you can hear all the monkeys now are going crazy. And that's the main guy, Hukumuri himself. Okay. So I suggest we go to reposition as he continues marking his territory there. We're gonna move forward a little bit and see whether he can come towards where we are. This is quite exciting. Okay, hold on for a second. Minamu, that's a great question. What makes leopards come out at night? Basically, when it cools off, and I'm sure Minamu, you may know, leopards tend to see better at night than maybe the prey I'm talking about. Look at him there, Minamu. I'm talking about impalas or watoks. They'll tend to see better, so it's a lot easier for them to come at night because if they're going to hunt, it gives them a better chance of hunting. We're gonna move forward a little bit and get ahead of it. This is quite exciting. All right, so Minamu, they'll see much better at night than during the day. Of course, even during the day, they see better, but they know the prey at night will not see very well. So that's a big plus for them. And also it's also the good time for them to go have a drink. All right, hold on, say it's off. Chances are there's a small little path here and you've got a feeling he's gonna come through this path and maybe head towards Galago. Pan for a drink that him himself. Hokumuri, very majestic. And walking and you can hear or the vivid monkeys. So let's see whether we can take a different angle here. All right. Yeah, and as I guess he's taking that path and most likely he's going for a drink. So let's see what direction we're gonna take as we go towards the Galagopan where we think he might be heading for a drink. Or the monkeys are going ballistic and more the velvet monkeys. Or the birds were also shouting there. So I just want to let my friends know where he is heading. Ooh, this is exciting. We haven't seen him. All right, let's first go to Taylor as I get a, I get a better position for you in one minute. Rats, who's ready to see something funny? I had an interesting encounter just before safari started today. And, um, okay, are you ready? I said, don't steal my cheese because Hornbills, for some bizarre reason, absolutely love cheese. I don't know where and why, but it was picking the last little bits from the grater. Oh, Wendy, I love it when you do this. It's so nice. Let's see if we can get it to start again. Um, so that happened today in camp, so it was quite funny. The, uh, the, the two yellow-billed hornbills uh, were fighting in the pots and pans as Happiness was preparing, um, well, I think she was preparing dinner. And then the even funnier thing happened is that one flew into the kitchen and now it was in the kitchen and now it was knocking over things now i'm trying to get this thing out and i'm so sad there was no one there to watch me anyways i managed to grab this hornbill as quick as i could and put its wings nicely because i didn't want it to hurt itself but now things were being smashed in the kitchen bottles were being pushed over and it was actually really relaxed what is that little bush baby his eyes there see that what are you? Oh, it's a nightjar. That's what it is. I think it's a little nightjar there. See, how is it that I can spot things like that, but I'm a celepid? I mean, I mean, earlier this morning, I'd spotted a pearl-spotted owlet in a gardenia far away. But anyways, so yeah, so we've had, uh, had to catch it. And this thing was surprisingly relaxed as well. <laughs> 
<laughs> Lewis, you said our hornbills do the dishes. You love them even more. Me too. They, they are really funny characters. I was just really surprised that that um, the hornbill wasn't pa it was panicked when I was trying to catch it. And then when I caught it, it was going quack, 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 quack. and just wasn't flapping or flailing. It didn't try and peck me. I was, like, I was almost thought to myself, I was going to be able to tell you this afternoon how sharp a hornbill's beak is because I thought it would have tried to peck me, but it didn't. So that was surprising. But I think that maybe just so used to us, maybe realize what I was trying to do that I'm trying to help it. I don't know. But it was quite a funny experience. Oh, little Dacre just zooted across the road. Just, just, it's still standing there, actually. It's still there. It's just walking up the... Yeah. Can we go into infrared? Please? There we go. There's a little Dacre. Now we can see it better. Obviously, at night time, I don't want to put on my any lights on this creature because it, well, it doesn't have the same type of rods and cones as his eyes that a leopard or a lion would have or a hyena that enable it to be able to see better and look how relaxed it is now because i think it knows it's got the cover of darkness little does it know that we're actually still watching it maybe it's thought we are looking at something else and off it goes and then what's here something's rustling did you hear that Something moved in here. It might be a little scrubby or something. This is also the hot spot for the southern white-faced scopsile. So in this tree actually coming up. Let's go up a little bit further. Maybe today will be our day. Let me check. Um, now, Jager, the most common owl out here. I'm actually going to say the pearl spotted owlet. We see and hear them the most, but we do also get uh, spotted eagle owls. We get for rose eagle owls, scops owls, uh, African scops owl, and then the southern white faced scops owl. So two different species. The barred owls we hear more than we see, but um, there are quite a few differences. No, they normally sit here in this tree. That's a pity. But oh, a little dip there. Uh, we'll keep looking in some of these trees. As, like you say, the wind, well, like David said, the wind is starting to down and it's so sheltered here. Yeah. Right. Anyways, I suppose you've got a leopard. Well, yes, we got Hukumuri himself. And what you want to do is get to some watering pan here that he'll always come and have a drink and wait for him and see whether he'll come over and drink here. So very quietly, we're just moving ahead here and we'll wait and see whether he'll come and have a drink at this point. We have seen him here very many times and we just want to swing around and see if he'll come here for a drink. How is that, Senzo? No, that's so let's just go around the other side. I think Senzo thinks that's much better. We're still having a little challenge of the pole. So we're gonna get the best position as then we're gonna wait for him to come drink most likely it's any time now we left him quite a distance and he's taking his time to get here so let's find out the best location or we guess he'll just come and have a drink how is that senzo that good okay so let, let's find out very quick quietly and see you can see you can see him coming we see him at the very end of the thicket. Quite a, quite a distance. I don't want to shed too much light. Very good. And I'll just shine the light on the side of it. I don't want to shine it directly on their face, on its face. That's Hokumuri there coming. But most important, the destination will be this watering hole. That's the good news. Very majestic, you can see the orange eyes there. And slowly and surely, waiting for a drink. What, what a sighting and what a leopard this is. Tingana should be a bit worried now with this kind of uh, male leopard. I'll switch off my spotlight and enjoy the IR, which will give us great views. One drink of fast mercury territory, very characteristic. Yes, I'm around, and definitely that's a message to Tingana. And straight to the watering pan, and we may have the pole on the way. Hopefully, 
Very good. Yes, and there he goes for a drink. I'll just move forward. Backward, okay. Let me just move a little bit forward to give Senzo a better angle. Because you still have the pole on the way. How is that, Senzo? That's okay. All right, Senzo see that's the best place. And this looks like a money shot to me and to all of us. Allow me just a radio to use my radio, let my co guides know where we are. And they can come and enjoy this beauty. How beautiful is this? Rex, uh, Ingrid, they're having a drink, and you can come over, come and join us, having a drink at the Galago Water Fund. Thank you very much, and look in final control, says very good audio of it, drinking water as it leaks with the tongue there. Sorry, I might use my radio again. You can hear it drinking and the water coming up. Must be a very thirsty leopard. What an amazing cat this is. Looking at us. Continuous drinking. Sorry, I may use my radio again. Uh, this is David Waldath. I'm the only station at the lock with Ingwe. Anybody, two of you are more than welcome to come and join. Uh, you're welcome. Rex, if you're close by, you're welcome. Come. And he just finished drinking. He might be moving out. We'll find out where he'll be going. We'll let you know. So he just finished drinking, not sure whether he'll do a bit of territory marking or he want to move. Good question. At what age do male leopards develop a tulip? I would guess anything six, seven years. And what should happen as I move? That's your question. They also pink, you see, on their nose. At the age of seven, it also tends to disappear. So six, seven years, you can see a fully matured or fully grown dewlap. That's the age, I would guess, six, seven years. So we're going to follow this duke, and you can see him in front of us there. Can you see him, uh, Senzo? So we're going to try and find out where he would be going. He didn't drink lots of water. That's normally not him. He normally drinks lots of water. And we're gonna follow him up and we just let know my colleagues know. There he is. Let's, let's move in front of him. He might come to the road and maybe that could make our life easier. So let's see. Let's scrub here. There he is on the road, Sanzo. Fantastic. I'll use my radio again for a few seconds. Uh, Rex, Ingwe, mobile now, and it's going towards the north. Uh, Ingwe, mobile now, towards north, and I'm following it uh, slowly, slowly. That's the majestic. We're going to follow our Hukumuri. He has been away for quite some time, and now we have him back. All right. We'll have my spotlight on, not to share it directly on him, but because he's going the other way, which is good for all of us. We'll find out where he'll be going. And as usual, he'll go. Mark his territory again. You can see him there. Very curses of leopard. Melena, you're asking what a dewlap. And if you look on the necks of leopards or certain animals like the, for, ex for example, elands, there's something, a very big mass that hangs below their necks and that is what a dewlap is it's a huge muscle that comes below their necks we want to find out where he has gone okay oh, hang on for a second Ooh. 
Mm-hmm. So let's follow this guy and find out where Hukumori will be leading us now. Okay, it's getting a bit dark here and quite a lot of uh, thickets. Let's find out where he just turned. Do you see it, Senzo? He just... So we'll slowly follow him and find out. Let's go to Taylor and as we find out where Hukumori is taking us. I'm a little bit envious that you have a leopard. Very cool, David. And I hope Okamori puts on a show for you this evening. Nice to have him around. And uh, we're not having much luck in in terms of the nighttime crit critters. A couple of scrub hairs here and there running away from us. And then haven't seen any owls, which is which was our goal this evening. Oh well. We'll keep we'll keep our eyes open though. All right, as soon as I start. I mean, sorry, as soon as I stop looking for an owl, one's going to arrive. So, we're just enjoying the afternoon mumble, really. David, have you had a good time just relaxing? Oh, that's good. He has to say that, though. He wouldn't, can't say anything ugly while we're live. <laughs> no, I'm joking. I'm only teasing. No, it's been, it's been a goodie. I see some lights. That must be where David is down over there or somebody. Um, been relaxing. I'm glad that the wind is stopping now. Like, I thought that we were going to have wind for the next week, but luckily, not now. Yeah. Marcy, a bush baby would be nice. Eh? That would be the ultimate little treat. So I'm going to check for you. This is a good area. It's become quite dense again. And uh, with bush babies, they, bush babies, they typically do like these sort of wooded areas. It makes it easier from bounce bouncing from tree to tree. They don't really spend too much time on the ground. They can, and they do, but they prefer to be up on the tops of the trees. So that's where we will be looking. And genets. I'm checking all the holes in all the trees too to see if there's a little genet that's curled up. Civets. have not seen a civet for a long time. And I was also hoping as we drove down the, in Yala Road north and south that we were going to see a porcupine because most mornings there are fresh diggings and fresh tracks of porcupine. One day we'll catch one out in that area. So that's often why I drive that ro road um, a little bit later at night. Well, at least once the sun has gone down, just to have a little check. And then the other road we're supposed to be doing, David, remember we said this on Bushwalk when we found, oh, we went and we looked at the Nkuhumas, was that fire break that we need to start driving, but we're a bit far away from that now. I have to remember that for tomorrow afternoon. But that's what we need to do is also go drive up and down there at this time and see if we can't catch that odd bark that um, we saw well, the diggings of. So, yeah, so we need to go and do that too. So there's lots of things that we've got planned. But sometimes you just don't end up getting to it. It's nice to explore around Torchwood a little bit, although I keep, I actually, I say explore. Um, I say explore, but I just kept driving the same roads round and round and round, convinced we were going to find the leopard there. Okay. Let's check down Philemon's cut line, because there was also that digging of the aardvark there. And again, this is, this is an opportunity for all these creatures to start being more sort of active. Nope. No owl. See, this is cool. This is where you start sort of searching and seeing if you can't see sort of silhouettes. You won't be able to see too much, unfortunately, because we've got the roof. But uh, even you don't even need a spotlight to spot an owl out here now, especially when you when the trees are silhouetted nicely. Obviously, you're in infrared. It does help when we're when we're a little bit in colour. We're going to stay in infrared. Let's see, because that's probably. One of the most amazing things to see is a big, big silhouette of a big owl. Maybe a nice rose eagle owl. I haven't seen one in ages. It used to be that one that lived in the Mulwati quite close to Twin Dams. I haven't seen it for quite some time. We were seeing it regularly last year at one point. I suppose it could have moved on though. Who is walking here? Let's see. Oh, this must be Hukumori's tracks. So this is where he's obviously come from. These are fresh leopard tracks on top of tire tracks. 
So I would assume he must have come out from this way, gone down towards the dam. Let's check if they go, if they go that way, then we know that it was him. If they don't, then it could be someone else. I don't know. Lee effect, you would love to see an owl. I think so. I think it'll be good. I think it'll sort of complete the drive. We've seen lots of different animals today, which has been very nice. Yes, indeed. Also, the dead, well, not the dead marulas, but the marulas that have no leaves on are also a good spot now. Good perching posts for for owls. Okay, come on, Ardvark. Come on, yes. Throw us a bone tonight, nature. We need it. We definitely need it. Might have to put the bright lights on just in case it's far down the road. They're quite shy creatures. So get ready. If we do see one, it's probably going to be a quick sighting. They don't normally hang around for too long, but it'll be nice to see how they react if we switch off with all the lights, not putting a spotlight on them, and just have the infrared on. I wonder how they would uh, react. Uh, I wonder if they'd be a little bit more relaxed, like what we just saw with the daycare. I'm, I'm pretty sure this thing that I'm waving around definitely intimidates some of the, the more shy creatures because they come out at night for a reason to be hidden in the darkness. So I think when you put a spotlight on a honey badger or on an aardvark or a civet or a genet, they panic. They're like, ah! Where did that come from? And then they're off they go. They're like this target. So, so it would make sense that with the infrared lights on, we should be more relaxed, which is quite exciting. Did they fill that hole up? The must have, eh? They haven't. Still there. Oh, no one's driven into it yet. Oh, <laughs> might be mine. Could be me. I think it's here. No? That's not it. Next one. Oh yes, it is the next one. Okay, I think David's having a bit of trouble trying to keep up with Hooker Maureen. Let's go and see if he can, well, still see him. Well, Hooker Maureen, I guess we saw him drinking. That was pretty special. And then he decided to enter some of the biggest thickets that I've not seen for a long time. He went in comfortably of course we saw him marking territory uh twice which i thought he was leaving a message clear message to tingana and then he decided to go chances are i got a feeling he might be going for a hunt and maybe tomorrow if you're lucky we might see him with a kill or might see him some food and uh, you're asking at what age do leopards start to send mark i would guess once they are weaned, maybe anything after two years, and they are not living with their mothers again, anything two years going up, they would be comfortably be able to start to scent mark. And I think the males are more in scent marking earlier than females. That would be my guess, because it's males that usually have more conflicts than females. That was quite a crucial sighting, only that uh, the leopard had to go. Scent marking for leopards is very important because it always helps to reduce any conflict between them. And if they have to, is only when one says, yes, there's a scent mark here, but I still want to find out who it is. And I'll go in the territory and just try and find out or have a little fight with whoever is owning this territory. Males will have more conflicts than females. Megan, you're asking, do any other cats have dewlaps? Cheetahs, definitely not. Leopards, definitely not. I think the only animals I've seen, or the only cats I've seen, Megan having dewlaps, are the leopards and not cheetahs and not lions. I only guess it's only leopards that will have the dewlaps and more so in the males and not the females. I'm sure, Megan, you know Tingana. To me, Tingana has such a massive dewlap comparing to Hukumuri. His dewlap is huge by any standard. So I would say Megan is only leopards that I know of in Africa with dewlaps. Only you asking what are leopards' natural enemies? I would say just two other competitive predators. I would say hyenas, orange, and lions. 
just have their natural enemies. I'm not sure whether I would say we human beings are enemies of leopards. People, of course, have been known for ages, maybe not now like before, going for their skins, making beautiful hearts, making nice coats, and making, you know, nice handbags. Maybe not anymore. But how exciting it was to have Hukumuri with us, eh? Weren't you know, lucky, eh? After having said, you know, it has been tough, we haven't been seeing all these leopards, and it was wonderful to see Hukumuri at the end of the day. We want to thank all of you for having joined us today. And remember, tomorrow, 06.30 hours Central Africa time, we'll be right back here and chance if we'll see Hukumori. From all of us, thank you and may you stay well.